Live from the Emerald City in Seattle, Washington, the UFO, Bigfoot, and Paranormal Hotspot of the Pacific Northwest, coming directly to you from around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Sunday. I am your host, Michael W. Hall, the Paranormal Lawyer, occupying the captain's chair tonight for SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show, including all of our listeners on the digital side at Revolution Radio. And don't forget, you can always find our archive shows for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do us all a favor and hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some Bumblefoot, shopping our Spaced Out Radio store, and catching up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and so much more. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by donating to Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. And welcome everyone to, um, oh gosh, this is May 9th already, 2021 and a Sunday night. Uh, happy Mother's Day to everyone out there and all of the wonderful ladies um, and uh, mothers that have, uh, you know, got us this far in the world and probably deserve a lot more credit than they ever get. So thank you for all the mothers out there on Mother's Day. Uh, tonight, we have a special show set aside for you. Um, it is going to be very interesting. I've got, of course, Peter Davenport, our weekly reports from the National UFO Reporting Center, going to check in with us about uh, some sighting reports that uh, have happened recently. Uh, and also, then we have uh, my main guest for the show this evening is Dr. Mark Mirabello. And uh, we are going to talk about all sorts of interesting uh, things, including uh, the afterlife as looked at various cultures from around the world. So that should be very interesting with uh, historian Dr. Mark Melabello. Uh, first of all, let's uh, see if uh, Dr. Mark is on the line. Are you there, Mark? Yes. Thank you for having me on your show. Wonderful. Thank you for taking the time out of your... Uh, uh, Eastern United States uh, time zone, <laughs> real late at night tonight. And uh, I understand you're hunkered down back at the university tonight to use your office for this broadcast. So I appreciate that as well. Yes, they have a much better internet connection, cameras, computers, so forth. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, and Peter, uh, Peter Davenport, are you there? I am here, Michael. You're loud and clear. And good evening, Mark. Good evening. Okay, well, wonderful. We um, uh, we are going to jump right in it here, Peter, because I understand you have some, um, you have uh, some not admonitions, but you have some like, um, some requests that you're going to bring to the audience tonight to help you out regarding these uh, SpaceX launches that keep driving you nuts as far as people trying to report UFOs that are being uh, misidentified, right? Driving me to distraction, you're correct. And I'm going to share a little information with our audience tonight and uh, I, with the hopes that it will allow them to avoid reporting as a UFO something that clearly is not. Wednesday night, the UFO hotline lit up like a Christmas tree, and that's happened every night subsequent to that first experience. People reporting a string or a stripe or a an army of uh, lights that looked like stars moving across their heads, moving through the night sky, I should say. And uh, the unusual thing is they, they describe them differently. P even people looking at the same cluster are describing them differently. I'll address that towards the end of my appeal here, but these, obje these objects are not UFOs. They are Starlink satellites. It's the program that Dr. Elon Musk has uh, promoted, designed, and is funding. And what their ultimate objective is, is to launch 
some 14,000 what they're calling microsatellites into orbit that will provide high-speed internet connectivity to anybody on anywhere on the globe who has a computer. But uh, my appeal is if people see a string of star-like objects pass overhead, not to call the hotline. I've taken well over 100 calls every night uh, for about these, these uh, satellites. And I thought I'd use this opportunity since we have a sizable audience to educate as many people as possible as to what these objects really are. In any event. Uh, yeah, I, I, would I would imagine, Peter, that uh, hopefully people will uh, start to realize what these things are and not uh, bother you so much about them. But uh, typically, what are they, what are they uh, reporting to you that you can point out is basically tells you right away that this is the Starlink satellite uh, deployment? Well, the most telling factor is a group of star-like objects oriented nose to tail in a straight line fashion and equidistant from one another. That's what most people uh, describe, but there is one curiosity to these formations. And I saw this on Wednesday and Thursday night. People are reporting that not one, but two groups of lights are going by. It suggests to me that what they're seeing is a first cluster uh, followed by a second completely different cluster that had been launched on a different date. But what the project is doing is launching a large pod uh, into orbit from Cape Canaveral. And the pod has up to 60 what they're terming microsatellites. And when the pod gets established in its proper orbit, it then ejects the individual microsatellites and they orient themselves nose to tail. And I think what is happening is, that has given rise to the diversity of reports is that people are seeing this operation at different times. Some people are seeing it as the microsatellites are being ejected other people see the stabilized formation. But it's a curiosity that there's such a diversity in what people are seeing. I've known for a long time that two or more witnesses to the same event oftentimes see, remember, and report different aspects of it. But in any event, I hope uh, one other noteworthy point is I've not received one report from anybody who's identified themselves as a space out radio listener. So maybe my my <laughs> admonition tonight is unnecessary. They're probably a smart group of people. Well, most of uh, our audience out there uh, would definitely know the difference between, uh, you know, a space, a space link uh, satellite chain. Although um, I have seen them myself just as far as, you know, various... Uh, social media uh, videos. And it is strange, even the, if you see it for the first time, I would imagine, and know what it is. Um, it's quite startling to see, like you said, 60s lights in the sky all in a, in a row, kind of traveling along, you know, at a, a lumbering pace and uh, no sound or anything like that. So it is fascinating. Yeah. In any event, thank you for allowing me to share that with our audience kick off the program tonight. And I have, I'd like to make another radical departure. I have one very good report that I'd like to share in a moment. And then I'd like to delve into a few former reports or past reports from the distant past and share with our audience some of the material that has come to our center about reports decades in the past. But more recently, on this past Tuesday, the 4th of May, I received a call from FAA headquarters in Virginia uh, apprising me of yet another air sighting by an airliner flight crew. I think this is the fifth or sixth 
report such a report that I've reported on Spaced Out Radio, Michael. The 13th of May of November, rather, I said May, 13th of November last year, the 26th of December last year, and uh, three other reports as well. But on the 4th of May, I received a report from a gentleman who works in headquarters at the FAA Center, apprising me that they had just received a report from an airliner crew apprising them that the, the airliner was somewhere over New Mexico. It's 37,000 feet, flight level 370. And the captain and first officer both saw an object streak from left to right in front of their airliner. And the captain reported to the FAA that it was moving at a velocity that he could not describe. It was so fast. So what it was, I have no idea. The FAA asked the captain whether he would like to uh, submit a report, and he declined. But thanks to the help of a uh, friend up in North Pole, Alaska, I just got some contact information tonight for the company that owns that aircraft, and I'm going to pursue it and see whether we can get that crew to submit a uh, report. In any event, this is a fairly radical departure from the last 27 years of reports in the sense that uh, we never received that many reports from airline crews in such a short period of time. And it could be due to publicity, more publicity, like Spaced Out Radio provides its audience, or it could be due to the fact that more objects are in our airspace and being seen more frequently by, by uh, airline or crews. But well, that, that is fascinating, Peter, the fact that uh, this uh, airline pilot, commercial airline pilot and his uh, first officer, are, are confirming that these things are going so fast that they can't even estimate the speed of these things traveling across their path, their flight path. Uh, I mean, if, if Dr. Richard Haynes um, was not retired from NARCAP, he would be totally interested in the pilot safety, airline safety aspects of something streaking across the flight path of a commercial airliner, you know, in, um, in our U.S. airspace. That is just fascinating. Yeah, it really is an alarming. Speaking as a pilot, having something unidentifiable passing through our airspace at that velocity is uh, a little unsettling to a pilot. Now, now, Peter, you mentioned that this might have happened over the airspace in New Mexico. But yes. then also, you also mentioned uh, North Pole, Alaska, in yes. in the equation. What? How does that uh, relate to the sighting itself? Well, in in preparation for this program, I called a friend who's an A and P mechanic in North Pole, Alaska, at Fairbanks, ah. at the Fairbanks Airport, thinking that since we had an N number for the airplane involved in the sighting, he might be able to trace the owner or crew, and he did. So uh, on some future program of Space Out Radio, I will report what, I, what information I'm able to obtain about the details of this sighting. All I know is that the aircraft was on a 165 degree radial at 25 miles from the major navigation aid in the Albuquerque area. I'll be able to tell more about that if I get manage to get in touch with the crew. Yeah. But, well, well, if if either of the crew members or anybody wants to would be uh, agreeable to being interviewed, of course, we would love to be able to talk to them about something like that. But yeah, whatever happens, happens. I guess if I manage to contact them, I'll certainly put that question to them. But while we're on the subject of airliner reports or report from airliner cockpit crews, I'd like to delve into a few past reports similar to this 
One comes from the Dallas Fort Worth, Texas area. And this report is on our website at ufocenter.com. It occurred, the sighting occurred on October 26, 1999 at 0236 hours local time. So just after midnight, not one, but two airliner crews contacted me. I won't identify the airline to provide them with anonymity, but both pilots were former, very experienced military pilots, one an F-16 pilot, the other an A-10 pilot. They were, their respective aircraft were in the vicinity of Dallas-Fort Worth flying from California, one to Atlanta and one to Miami. And as they flew to the east, they both reported to the FAA in rapid sequence that they had just witnessed a very large fireball, large being on, in the vicinity of the size of a full moon in the night sky, streaking at their aircraft from the north, suddenly doing a what they estimated to be a right angle turn faster than you can blink an eye and streaked out ahead of their aircraft and disappeared from the pilot's sight. So we used to get these reports. We got a few of them in the past, but again, as I've recounted tonight already, not nearly as frequently as we've been getting them over the last five months or so. That was a very interesting report. Now, now that is uh, fascinating to me because, of course, you've been reporting on orange fireballs uh, since May, I think, of, uh, what was that, 2013. 13. You're right. Uh, but you don't really hear the, the stories of a fireball making a right-angle turn. I mean, that is unusual. Yes, it is. Although one of the pilot reports I received for the 26th of December last year, which I reported on Space Out Radio, I believe, the uh, pilot reported that the object did several abrupt turns, almost instantaneous of turns, as it moved across the sky. In other words, it was not flying in a straight line, which you would expect of a meteor or something along those lines. And while we're on the subject of aviation reports, I have another that I'd like to share with our audience. This one comes from Rhode Island, state of Rhode Island, June 22nd, the year 2000. A commercial pilot flying from Nantucket Island to, that is Massachusetts, up to Manchester, New Hampshire, reported shortly after the incident that he had been flying to the northwest, skirting out west of heavy weather over Rhode Island and Boston, and he glanced up towards the sitting sun. This was at 2115 hours, close to the longest day of the year, so he could probably see the sun still from his altitude. And his attention was drawn to a black object, which at first he took to be a very large soaring bird. He quickly realized that it was not a soaring bird. It, he was at 7,500 feet, which is pretty high for most soaring birds. He glanced down in his cockpit for just a fraction of a second and looked back to the horizon to the northwest and then realized that this object was not a bird at all, but a it was an egg-shaped, oblong-shaped object streaking at his aircraft. It went over his aircraft, he estimates, at very high speed, and it passed within 50 ver five zero vertical feet of his aircraft. He got on the radio to air traffic control and asked them whether they had any aircraft in his vicinity. And I got the audio from the FAA under Freedom of Information Act request, and they reported that they did not have any aircraft and just a few seconds later, they called him back 
and apprised him that they did finally see the object. It was behind his aircraft and it had executed approximately a 180 degree turn as fast as their equipment could register the change. So we are we have gotten reports from aviation cockpit crews throughout my tenure as director of the National UFO Reporting Center. But the frequency of those reports is increasing. In any event, I would like, I wanted to share that or those reports with our audience tonight just to let them know that we relish past sighting reports. And if we have anybody, particularly pilots, who experience these kinds of sightings, I would urge them to submit reports using the online report form on our website. Um, and, and obviously that's uh, something that more and more people, I think, are becoming less and less reticent to do, given the fact that the uh, Department of Defense and the Navy are coming straight out now and saying that they are, they're, they're pilots in the military have cited these things as well. So it's almost as if um, they've been given the green light for pilots to report these historical sightings. Yeah. I was amused by the reports from the Navy and the furor that they generated because I feel I've been reporting similar and equally dramatic sightings submitted by at least civilian air crews and in some cases military. So. Oh yeah. No, you, um, it's, it, it's gotta be old news for you. You know, all of the things that you've been reporting over the decades at the national UFO reporting center. Um, matter of fact, I, I would encourage people out there that if they ever get a chance, uh, just go to uh, newfork.org or national UFO reporting center and look up their, their own, um, area where they live. Because it's fascinating to find out all the sighting reports that have been reported, uh, and you probably didn't even know it happened in your area. Yeah, that's usually the case. And a fact that I find particularly interesting is the relatively low number of people who see what they believe were UFOs who actually report it. My estimate is that number could be as low as one out of 20,000 sightings ever gets reported to an organization like mine for any of a number of reasons. But yeah, it, it, that's just astonishing to me, too, because uh, in my research and in my investigations, uh, I'll run across people who uh, don't necessarily want to talk about uh, a sighting, but then they will see that I'm interested in it, and they'll tell me their their uh, their sighting that they had, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and uh, come to find out they've probably seen more than that, and they just haven't been haven't took the time to say anything about it. Yeah, one of the most difficult jobs I have, and Mark, our other guest, Mark. Mirabello probably would concur, trying to get somebody to write something down in a clear, eloquent, grammatically correct fashion is one of the most difficult jobs I've ever had in my life. <laughs> it just, uh, a lot of people don't want to write, they want to tell you the story. And there's not enough time left in my life to listen to all of these stories. That's why I'm adamant on having people who believe they've seen UFOs or even a Bigfoot to write it down and submit it using our online report form at ufocenter.com. I have a question for Mr. Davenport, if I could interject one. Yes. Um, I teach a course at my university, Shawnee State University, on myths and legends. Now, when I teach myths, I use the original sort of, shall we say, the Germanic notion that it's an idea that we helps us orient ourselves in the universe. It may be true or false, but what's important is we believe it, and it really defines what who we are and so on and so forth. And I, I mentioned that we have them in science and religion, in political science and economics and so forth. But the one I wanted to ask you about, and, and it's perhaps maybe the more experienced UFO researchers have just dismissed this as a hoax, 
But um, has any work been done? Are you familiar with what's called the UMO legend, U-M-M-O? Yes. Uh, and do um, the notion that roughly in 1950, these entities landed from this other planet. They've been here for years. They look European in appearance. They're also sensitive to light. They only they sleep by day, come out by night. Um, and I was curious: do is it dismissed as a hoax by most UFO researchers, or is it seriously researched? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm familiar with the story, and I think I've read a synopsis of it ages ago. I don't feel I'm sufficiently current on the subject to be able to address it intelligently. Uh, but uh, it's certainly well known among serious minded investigators. Whether it's true or not, I couldn't say. I'd hesitate to take a position on it. But what I find interesting about it is allegedly, a beginning, I think it was in the early 1960s, individuals were receiving telephone calls and letters posted from all over the world. And the calls typically come late at night, last for several hours. The people are told, do not talk about what we're talking about. If you do, we'll stop contact. And there's even been one French academic paper published on information he claims he got from his UMO contact. So uh, I actually talk about it briefly in, in my lectures. I allude to it, but I was just uh, found it intriguing. And um, the as we talked before we came on the air, uh, I've always found the unusual uh, interesting. And I, it's a shame that most mainline scholars uh, are sort of afraid to look into it. Uh, there was a Russian named Karyevsky from the 19th century. He called that timid prudence. We're so afraid to being ridiculed or laughed at. Uh, we simply endorse orthodoxy and close our eyes to the unusual. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, we have these good researchers such as yourself going out there and exploring these ideas. Yeah. One person who would certainly know about it is, uh, I believe it's Dr. Jerome Clark, who used to work with NICAP. Hmm. I believe it was NICAP. And he's an excellent researcher. If I can think of anybody who would know about Umo, it would be he. Interesting. Yeah. Also, if I may ask one more, uh, I know some researchers believe, because I'll be re referring to this notion also in my afterlife discussion, that these are entities from another dimension, like Jacques Vallée referred to that. Do most of the experienced researchers view them as alien spacecraft or as time travelers or ultra-dimensional beings? Um, what, what's the orthodoxy on this? I'm not sure there's an orthodoxy, but I can speak for my own part on it. I, I think the simplest explanation is probably the one that's most accurate. And I think we're dealing with material craft uh, piloted by intelligent creatures who have come to this planet for God only knows what reason uh, and have been here for a long time, certainly centuries, probably millennia. That's what the evidence suggests to me. And it could be even millions of years they've had a presence on our planet. By the way, speaking of, um, again, suppression of evidence reminds me there's a reference um, in um, Flegon of Troy, of Trays, sorry, uh, Trails. I uh, had a mind freeze there for a moment. He describes, he was an ancient Greek writer, and he describes off the coast of, uh, well, on an island off the coast of Greece. And he does it in a matter of fact way, and most historians never even refer to it. They just dismiss it as a ridiculous concept. He describes the discovery of a coffin in which there was the, the they found the mummified remains of a being roughly 130 feet tall, dressed in clothing. They had, there was an inscription with the coffin giving his name and mentioning that he had lived for 6,000 years. Now, <laughs> again, it's just dismissed as a uh, kind of a stupid story by most historians that ever mention it, but it wouldn't be intriguing if they actually uh, recovered. Perhaps it was some uh, entity long ago who had 
perhaps was marooned on earth, lived here for 6,000 years, and then passed away. Be curious. Reminds me of another reference when Alexander the Great is uh, attacking what at the time was viewed as an impregnable city, the city of Tyr, uh, that was built out on an island off the coast of Lebanon. And uh, the accounts in antiquity say that during the siege, flying shields appeared in the sky. And there was the, the walls collapsed. One of the walls collapsed. And again, historians just edit that out. Uh, yeah. say that can't possibly be true, but perhaps he was assisted uh, from space, perhaps. Uh, anything's possible. Yeah. Well, I feel I'm stepping on your time, Dr. Mirabello, and I should let you and Michael continue this conversation. Well, oh, that, thank you. That, that was just great. Fascinating. Thank you for jumping in there, Mark, on, on uh, some of your interest in that regard. Um, I, I can verify that the uh, Umo legend in ufology is quite um, historic. People are uh, really into that as well. And the idea that uh, these things could be interdimensional, like Jacques Vallée is mentioning, um, and those kinds of things. I, I think that's uh, a lot of what people are talking about as well. So I think it's a time in our um, research and our uh, investigation that is totally breaking wide open now with all of these various, you know, ancient historical uh, sightings and, and uh, uh, you know, evidence that seem to corroborate something's been happening on our planet for a long, long time. So thank you for that as well. Peter, uh, it's been always a pleasure to have you on again for the show. And let's give out uh, at least the uh, mailing address to the National UFO Reporting Center, just in case uh, I would encourage people to do this. Send uh, Peter uh, maybe a donation here and there be because all of the decades of hard work he's done, uh, keeping the uh, lights on at the National UFO Reporting Center and and uh, paying for that bandwidth and, uh, and the telephone bills would be helpful. If you uh, give that address, maybe people can send you some. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to do that, Michael. The Postal address of the National UFO Reporting Center is P.O. Box 700, 700, 700, that, and that's Davenport, Washington, D-A-V-E-N-P-O-R-T, Washington, zip code 99122. And thanks again. You're welcome. Have a great week. We'll talk to you next time. Yep. Thank you, Michael. All righty. By the way, may I interject something else before we get into my topic is, yeah. Um, I, again, as I think we mentioned before, we went on the air. I'm a, I'm a generalist. And I've done a wide variety of study, a wide variety of areas. And I have a book called The Odin Brotherhood, which is on a pagan secret society. And although I don't get in depth in that particular book, because I was just trying to discuss the beliefs there, they have this rather curious notion, that interesting notion. When I say curious, it be interesting that these godlike beings, and they're referring to the Norse gods, live in our universe. And which, by the way, is a widespread notion in many cultures. The idea of modern Christian West in particular, that if God exists, he somehow is not in our world, our universe, our cosmos. Antiquity normally placed the gods within and goddesses or God within our universe. And the Epicureans, the Greek philosophical school, described the gods as sort of really powerful supernatural beings that really don't pay much attention to us, but live here in our universe, our cosmos. And what's interesting is um, these gods literally use tools and, and um, devices to travel. And according to this Odin Brotherhood group, and oddly enough too, they live in the past. They're here all the time and they time travel oh. to our present time. Uh, some years ago, I was on an ancient alien program, the ancient aliens program on right. deadly cults, it was called. And they film you for four hours and they take clips and put them in the program. And I thought I made what I thought was an interesting point that perhaps the notion that we are seeing that earlier peoples saw um, uh, aliens and thought they were gods, 
which is the mm -hmm. whole core of the ancient alien program. Yep. So it's possible that in fact, um, gods are being, I should say, uh, we're seeing gods and thinking they're aliens. <laughs> it's, um, uh, it's one well that I we like, all, I like that. Yeah. Yes, that's, it, that's, it, that's very good, very good, uh, analysis as well. And by the way, we've known for some years, we always interpret the unknown in terms of the known. Um, mm -hmm. At Fatima, in the early 20th century, three children who were herding a flock of sheep uh, saw a three-foot-tall entity whose mouth did not move, look like a young, roughly 18-year-old girl with black eyes, and because they were pious Roman Catholics, they immediately assumed it was the Virgin Mary. But an ancient Greek would have thought it was a goddess. A medieval Celt would have thought it's one of the fairy folk. And probably a modern, secular, atheistic American may think he's looking at an alien. So we interpret the unknown in terms of the known. And there was a really interesting study in the 1950s, French scholar, they went to a really remote area in equatorial Africa. This is before some of the modern developments. And they were showing these village people pictures from American sci-fi films of flying saucers and spacemen and so forth. And they asked the villagers, what is this? And not a single person said a god. Not a single person said an alien. They all said these are American or European engineers. <laughs> ah. And it's because whenever they encountered something unusual in the rainforest, probably there was an American there doing something yeah, yeah. unusual. So uh, oh that uh, that is very uh very fascinating that analogy that you just made. People wouldn't really understand that unless they've studied the the area that you have done. The fact that you use that frame of reference from your past uh, to explain what, what you're seeing right now. And I, I think the idea that you came up with for um, potentially mistaking gods for aliens uh, brings me back to the, um, uh, the Q on Star Trek, you know, where there's an actual character who is a god. That's the god uh, Apollo? Uh, actually, they call him Q in Star oh, okay, Trek. Okay, okay, I see. Uh, and he's a you know a really great great actor, uh, character actor. But uh, the idea being that uh, you would actually uh, have to run across in in the flesh an actual god, you know, and deal with it. By the way, the reason I said Apollo there in the original uh, the original TV Star Trek series, they go to this planet in which they encounter this entity claiming to be Apollo. Ah. And it's one of my favorite episodes because Kirk starts to believe that maybe this Apollo and his comrades really did visit ancient Greece, but he still thinks it's just an alien. And at the end of the episode, they use the uh, Enterprise to destroy this temple, which they think is the form, the source of his power. He's able to do wonderful things. Uh, and they think, okay, this guy is using tools. So they destroy his little temple. And at the end, he starts to show great grief when they do this. And he says, my children, you have changed. And then he grows to gigantic size and says, Zeus, Hera, uh, Hermes, you were correct. They no longer want us gods. And the episode closes. You really can't tell. Was it a god or was it an alien? And it's really well done. I forget who wrote the uh, oh yeah screenplay for this. Um, oh, I'll, I'll bet that sounds like one of the classics. Yes. Now moving into and I, I asked you if I could discuss afterlife concepts. Of course. And and, um, and for your audience, I have a work called. Uh, it's in fact the last book I published. It's called A Traveler's Guide to the Afterlife. And uh, I'm presently working on a work on secret societies. I, I, I'm all over the map, so to speak. All right. And um, but the I want to make it clear that when I talk about afterlife concepts, I was covering all historical and prehistorical epochs, and also all many, many, many different cultures. Human race has spent 99 percent plus of its existence 
as hunters and gatherers. So we just should not dismiss their belief systems. And uh, I should also point out that it's the ultimate question. Uh, is there an afterlife and what happens to us? And uh, I'd like to mention um, Blaise Pascal, who was a 17th century philosopher, but also a mathematician and the father of probability theory in mathematics. And now he actually phrases it in Christian terms about the belief in God, but I'll rephrase it in terms of afterlife concepts. According to Blaise Pascal, if you disbelieve, for example, that there's an afterlife and you are right, you gain absolutely nothing. But if you believe in an afterlife and you are correct and you plan accordingly, the potential gain is enormous. Imagine you're at a gambling table and they say, okay, you can place your bet here. And even if you win, you win nothing. Or you can place your bet here. And if you win, you're going to be a multimillionaire. So we should explore. And too many, especially Americans, um, are completely disinterested in the subject. Or if they study it, they, and I don't mean to in any way denigrate our Western Judaic Christian tradition, but they have a really simple point of view that it's, there must be, if it, uh, it's always, there's a God connected. It's based on ethics and everybody has a soul. But in fact, as the book explores, um, there are, well, first of all, there, we've discovered cultures such as the Aboriginal people of Central Australia that have no God originally. They had no concept of a God. Really? Right. Yes. It was interesting when 19th century scholars studied these people, they spun it in a Christian way. And they said, one of the groups talked about a huge serpent that lived in the bottom of a lake and they were making offerings to it. So this British missionary wrote a book claiming this was their, remember these are really kind of racist and uh, arrogant people, Victorian England. He says, this is these childlike beings, these primitive people working together the initial idea of a God. It's just a big snake. But my main point here is they didn't have a God, but they had, an after, they had a notion of an afterlife. In fact, it was really intriguing. Indeed, when they first encountered the British, they thought they were dead ancestors mainly because of the white appearance. In many cultures, white is the symbol of death. It is in Africa. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Bones are white, termites are white, and they think of white symbolizes death. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Livingston, the famous Congregationalist Scottish missionary along the Zambezi River in the 19th century, by the way, famously died on his knees reading the Bible. He was that devout. He described how when he went into certain areas uh, north of what is now Zimbabwe, people, especially women and children, ran from him in terror because he said it was the equivalent of Londoners seeing a mummy leave the British Museum and walk out the front door. <laughs> he had white skin, which to them symbolized death. He had yellowish hair, and in extreme famine conditions, the hair of Africans bleaches out if they're starving. So they equivalent, they equate uh, light hair with famine and death. He had blue eyes. And when corpses decompose, there's a blue film on their eyes. They'd see it on black people, blue eyes, as they were rotting in the bush. So they literally thought death had visited their village. So oh, that's um, fascinating. Yes. And, uh, Obviously, Dr. Livingston spent a lot of time with those natives in that area, for sure. Yes, and yeah. experienced uh, difficult times and uh, mainly the disease factor. Uh, European immune systems just couldn't handle some of the conditions. So oh, yeah. He lost his wife and, and I think children as well to these illnesses. Yeah, and, and his, uh, uh, his son was on a quite a quest to be able to find him for years, I understand, mm -hmm. uh, before... Um, it wasn't his son who found him. I mean, but, Henry uh, Stanley. Henry Stanley. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a fascinating story. Back in those days, people really had a commitment uh, to research and travel. 
I mean, and, and like you said, he was a devout uh, Christian himself doing all of this at the same time. I, I'm, I'm amazed. Oh, and by the way, another point I'd like to bring out to your audience, and incidentally, um, as a learned lawyer, and I respect the legal pro uh, profession, I have my niece, Ashley Alaker, and her husband, Joe Alaker, are lawyers. Can I tell an afterlife lawyer joke? Oh, I would love it. That would be great. <laughs> This was actually told to me by a retired judge who was a born again Christian. Uh huh. And I was, I can't, don't even know his name anymore. I was chatting at this party and he uh, told me this joke. And he talked about this lawyer who passes away and he's at the gates of heaven, standing in line. And there's St. Peter with a clipboard. And the man ahead of him says, My name is Fred Williams and I'm a born again Christian. And Peter looks at the clipboard and says, welcome. You're in barracks 142, uh, floor 71, bunk 13. <laughs> and then the lawyer comes up and says, I am John Smith Esquire, a successful lawyer. And Peter looks at the clipboard and says, you're in that penthouse up there in building one, top floor, luxury apartment. And Peter's astonished. And he says, St. Peter, um, how come the born again Christian is in a barracks and I'm in a penthouse? And Peter replies, we have a lot of Christians here, but you're the first lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very well told. Exactly. So um, and not a whole lot of them, not a whole lot of them make it that far. That's for sure. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of unfair. By the way, it reminds me, there's uh, the British will say that um, you may have heard this one as well, because I study alternative religions. I lecture on witchcraft and pagan religions and Hinduism, Buddhism and so forth. And they say that lawyers actually are like witches in a sense, that often they experience prejudice. But whenever anyone is in trouble, they call a lawyer. <laughs> Or a witch. <laughs> there, there you go. Oh, that's a good one. Good analogy. I like yeah, and that. And then he goes on to say that both of them also generate business for themselves. Like you lay a hex or you file a lawsuit and you create business. Yeah. So at uh, any rate, yeah, now, or... I also, I'm sorry. I wanted to point out that um, when I published the book and um, I had, again, uh, well, Buddhism says there's over 80,000 paths to enlightenment. But I noticed... In the West, for example, there I received a critical review at Amazon.uk in which the man said, oh, my gosh, he collected all of these contradictory uh, afterlife concepts that contradict one another. This shows how false all of this is. And, of course, that's not my intention. I, it's very possible that all of these are legitimate paths. And... Um, uh, we're, we, we regrettably are kind of poisoned by Aristotle, who had that simple two-value logical system. We still teach this, and science is based on it, that something's either true or false. But in fact, there are many, many paths to uh, the other side, and there are many, many notions. And in fact, I mentioned earlier, these Aboriginal people um, did not believe in God, but they believe in ghosts. And by the way, Ghosts are universally believed in. We have never found a culture that did not believe in ghosts. Now, of course, modern historians and psychologists dismiss this as childlike behavior. 19th century historians, before modern political correctness emerged, used to dismiss traditional peoples as childlike, pre-logical, they call them. And they said, for example, if you, a psychologist, if he interviews a child, they think that dead people will still exist. And psychologists conclude from this that if you believe in an afterlife, you're childlike. But in fact, that's not the case. And I should mention in many cultures, such as Tibetan Buddhism, you encounter what you expect. They have this really no interesting notion. It's called non-dualist thought, that everything is thought. Matter doesn't exist. We just think it does. And remember, when you're in your dream tonight, you'll think that world is real. And you'll touch things. You'll smell things. You'll see things. And it's absolutely real. 
So we often have in Eastern cultures the notion either that we're dreaming this world or that we're in Hinduism has the concept we're in the dream of a god. And But it's not really a real universe. In fact, if you look at some of the notions, a hydrogen atom, if I remember correctly, if the proton is the size of a basketball, the electron is the size of a pencil point and is 11 miles away. Oh, my. The rest of it is empty space. Yeah. Our current model of the universe is matter is 99.99999% empty space. Is that really, we are taught this and we believe it, but perhaps it's just thought. In fact, Sir James Jeans, who was a noted cosmologist before he died, I think he died in the 1930s, said near the end of his career, he began to think the universe seemed less like a machine and more like a thought. Uh -huh. So, uh, but Tibetan Buddhists will say, if you're an atheist, or a skeptic, and you die, you encounter what you expect. So you'll find yourself alone in blackness. And you can't believe you're dead because as an atheist and a secularist, you think there is no afterlife. So you're terrified thinking you're in some kind of coma or a nightmare. But in fact, you are indeed dead, but you can't grasp it because your worldview rules it out. So again, it's important to, um, un by the way, these notions that you encounter what you expect is always fascinating to me. And what this means is, very literally, the Comanche Indian who expected to go to another world where he could hunt bison and drink wild cherry juice, he will encounter that. And the born again Christian will encounter Jesus and his loved ones. And the, and the Norse pagan will go to Valhalla. And the witches will go to Summerland. And the Muslims will indeed receive the 72 virgins in paradise. Oh, speaking of which, when we had the terror attacks, that was so distorted. Every Muslim, now it's told from a male perspective, receives the 72 virgins. You don't have to fly into a building or be a martyr. Ah. And in fact, what they believe is, this is why Islam is such a successful religion. Most Americans wouldn't realize this. Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi, Gaddafi are guaranteed heaven. Islam teaches, if you are a good Muslim, you go immediately to paradise. That's what they meant by the martyr death. Those are good Muslims, so they go immediately to paradise. If you are a bad Muslim, such as Gaddafi, or Saddam Hussein, you go to a temporary hellish region that resembles the Roman Catholic purgatory. Mm -hmm. You will suffer for your sins for a time, but ultimately you'll be released because all Muslims are guaranteed heaven. When I was a young whippersnapper, I was lecturing on this in a huge class. Before I came to Shawnee State University, I briefly taught at the University of Toledo and they had 200 students, and many of them were Muslim students from Malaysia and other places. And I was young and kind of clueless, and I looked to this Malaysian girl in the front row and said, um, is this, I knew, I know now it's true, but I was younger. I said, is this still taught that here Muslims go to paradise, but everyone in the room, because they're, un, they're infidels, will go to hell? And in this really sweet, quiet, feminine voice, she says, yes, yes, you all go to hell. <laughs> 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 but that is the teaching. And yeah. by the way, um, uh, I should mention, too, that oddly enough, um, hell is oddly enough not found. Well, in fact, I should make it clear, until civilization is developed, there's no ethical component to the afterlife. Everybody goes to the same place. And typically, it's to the west or somewhere in that location, because that's where the sun sets. P traditional people's reason by analogy. Uh -huh. And it's when civilization emerges, you get the idea of, of um, rewards and punishments. And, it, it, and this is not my idea. It does seem to be a means of social control, that 
when you're living in in a, a really terrible situation and you see the rich evil man in the big house and you're told, well, he will pay for his sin someday and you'll be rewarded. Um, although I, I should mention while I'm on it, to be fair to the Christians now, uh, most Americans don't realize this. The Mormons fundamentally really don't have a hell. And this is often misunderstood. They have the outer darkness. And oddly enough, anyone who's been a Mormon who becomes an apostate goes there. But even wicked people go to a heaven, a lower heaven. Everybody goes, they have three heavens. And then the highest heaven has three levels, the celestial heaven. And even bad people and disbelievers go to a heaven-like existence. Here's what's curious. The highest heaven, you literally become a god. Now, because this is so unusual in terms of Orthodox Christianity, they don't talk about it very much. But for example, if you undergo a special endowment ceremony in a Mormon temple, and you receive a Mormon baptism, and you undergo this ceremony, and you follow the moral rules, and oddly enough, if you, you have a ceremony where you marry forever, you go through marriage. Marriage is really important to, to Mormons. That's why they came up with polygamy. It was not only scriptural, but they had a male shortage. And you can't receive the highest heaven unless you're married. There's a marriage joke in there, but I won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can only receive the highest heaven if you're married. So they this led them to rather a curious notion of they will marry dead people. Oh. If, it, if it looks as if you will never get married, you can go through a ceremony to marry usually a famous Mormon who's deceased, uh -huh. such as Brigham Young or Joseph Smith. Now, another concept is they have even those in the outer darkness can get out. You can actually accept the true faith in hell. This led to a curious notion, and again, they were attacked for this because it was misunderstood. They practice what's called baptism of the dead, in which a Mormon will have baptism by proxy. He'll select someone. That's why they have all those genealogical records in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. They'll trace deceased people, and they'll go through a ceremony in which they're baptized for that dead person. And a few years ago, somebody published an article that said they had baptized by proxy Adolf Hitler. Uh -huh. And this caused outrage in the press. And it's true because even a wicked person in the Mormon system can repent, accept the true faith, and go to heaven. And while I'm on it, in Eastern religions, no hell is forever. Uh, the Buddhists have a hell that can last 200 million years. But after your, um, uh, you've paid, burned off that bad karma, you can come back even as a god or a human or a demigod. And, um, but so there's no one else really has damnation forever. You only see that in, frankly, Christianity and Islam. Although even Christianity has what's called universalism. I already told the Mormons don't really have it. And universalist traditions in which Origen, an early church father, said that even Satan himself would be eventually um, forgiven by God and welcomed into heaven. Um, which always reminds me, I hope, I'm hoping I'm not going on too many rambling here, but... No, this uh, is fascinating. Um, there's a great tale from 19th century Europe of Eloa, and she was the angel when Jesus wept in the garden before his arrest, his tear struck the ground and this angel came into being. This is the story. And her name was Eloah. And she was the most beneficent and kind-hearted of all angels. And she's in heaven, as an angel should be. But she could not be happy as long as anyone was in hell. So she goes down voluntarily to hell to try to convert Satan himself. And in fact, she fails. 
this virtuous, beautiful, angelic woman uh, tries to convert him, but he's so corrupt, she fails. And at the end of the story, this is a folktale. It's not really told by the Bible or, or scripture. Um, she falls in love with him. You know, the girls always like the bad boys. <laughs> yeah. And she, stay, rather than go back to heaven, she stays in hell with her man. Which, of course, is a tale that, especially where I live in southern Ohio, many women can identify with that. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> so um, um, this notion, again, of, um, and, and while I'm on it, too, if you're in your audience, um, um, in terms of, I said that hell is not forever in most cultures. Uh, strangely enough, Judaism has some interesting notions there. Uh, oddly enough, well, I shouldn't say odd. I should say it's curious. First of all, it causes misunderstanding because when the rabbis discuss afterlife in the Kabbalah and the Talmud, they're not talking about the human race. They're talking about their own people. And this is often misunderstood. Ah. Point one, um, their hell only lasts one year. They name four entities that have lived that will stay in hell longer. But for Jewish people, first of all, when you pass away, if you're Jewish, you have what's called the suffering or the judgment of the grave. You will feel the decomposition. That's why Jews don't embalm because they want that person to decompose really rapidly. They bury them without any kind of metal. That's another ancient taboo. Metal is always obnoxious to the gods, as Sir James Fraser says. So there's no metal in the coffin, no metal in the per person. They'll typically put a bag of earth on his belly. This is to speed up the decomposition process so that grandpa will not feel, it'll shorten his suffering. Ah, And then if he's a bad person, he may go to hell, but it only lasts one year and he gets the Sabbath off. <laughs> uh, he's in fire six days a week and then gets to go to a mountain of snow on the Sabbath. And when the year is up, he is uh, allowed to uh, go to heaven. Now, here's another notion. I should clarify that. I shouldn't say heaven. I should say Eden. Jews claim that nobody goes to heaven because that's where God lives. They say that Eden is where people go. And in fact, if you look at Genesis, Eden still exists. It's yeah. Uh, yeah. It, they, They're expelled and there's an angel put to guard it. A right. cherub with a flaming sword. And oddly enough, by the way, I was surprised that ministers didn't pick up on this. We bombed Eden during the two Gulf Wars. The Bible clearly indicates there's four rivers, and two are Tigris and Euphrates. So I don't know why people didn't think the end time was coming when the United States Air Force is bombing Eden. That yeah. was quite alarming to me. Yeah. Oh, by the way, while I'm on it, the, the book of Revelation refers to um, wormwood of fire will fall from the sky mm -hmm. at the end times. The Russian word for wormwood is Chernobyl. Oh, my. So, again, why people weren't alarmed by that is beyond me. I think it's because we're so ethnocentric. We just study uh, America and Western Europe, and we just ignore too many cultures. Oh, and incidentally, if I could work this in regarding reincarnation actually the more technical term is transmigration of souls um this is so misunderstood in the west when they look at americans look at hinduism and buddhism and they don't realize first of all your next life well doesn't have to be in the future to eastern cultures well they say imagine a, a river humans stand at the bank of the river watching water flow by the gods see the entire river all at once and they say that's called brahma time so all time exists forever so what this means is your very next life you could be born as a roman legionnaire in the time of christ you could be born in ancient babylon also a lot of americans don't realize this the Puranas, Hindu texts, discuss 
other worlds with inhabitants, planets, advanced civilizations in the piranhas. Flying machines are discussed. You may be reborn in an alien civilization somewhere in the universe in your next life. Now, another point, Americans think it's like a last judgment. I commit sins, I commit good deeds, and then they're added together. And then if I'm good, I go up in rebirth. If I'm bad, predominantly I go down. That's not how it works. Ah. Each completed act produces a future life, another life. If I help an elderly lady across the street, I've created a future life in those few seconds that'll be good. If I insult somebody, if I harm someone, um, I will create a future life where it's bad. In fact, in our current lifetimes, we're creating thousands of other lives. The Buddha. They had the same notion in Buddhism. He was asked by one follower about a future life. And he said, don't worry about it. He pointed to one of the Himalayas and says, see that mountain? It's whatever, 25,000 feet tall. All of your bones from all of your lives, if gathered here, would be taller than that mountain. So in Eastern traditions, they don't even take each, well, let me put it this way. Um, you get these Americans uh, being hypnotized and say, I, I was Henry VIII in a previous life. That doesn't matter. In Eastern thought, everybody, your audience, if they're listening to this, if these people are correct, everyone has been a king. Everyone's been a queen. Everyone's been a pirate. Everyone's been a pirate victim, a rapist, a rape victim, a felon, a saint, We've had millions and millions and millions of lives. And that's what their enlightenment techniques, nirvana, is to achieve release from these endless rebirths. And when you're reborn in this life, it's not, for example, this is not, according to Eastern thought, this is not what I am. I now have a temporary role like an actor in a theater play. When I'm here, my assignment is to do the best possible performance as a history professor. But when I, and then if I do that, the best possible performance, I go up. If I don't, I go down in the cycle of rebirth. But you can't confuse one life with this, the, the person. But in contrast, Western religions, we do want the personality to, to uh, continue. Uh, in fact, it appears as if ancient Egypt did too. Uh, a lot of Egyptologists, I think, misunderstand this. 19th century ones understood it, but the modern ones are too specialized. Mummification clearly is to preserve the personality. They would even put linen with mud inside to preserve the features, make sure the nose didn't collapse, the face, and... Um, Herodotus, the Greek writer, said they believed in rebirth. And they said they would do this for 3,000 years. But then by mummifying, you would freeze the person. So he continues in the next world um, as that person, as the pharaoh, for example. And while I'm on it, their, their afterlife was just utterly fascinating. And interrupt me if I'm going on too many different directions here, but no, um, they're, they're, they they actually, it was an endless journey. They didn't go anywhere. It was an endless journey. Uh, when you died, you joined the sun god. They, they said in their religion, every morning the sun god was born anew in the arms of his mother, the sky goddess Nut. If you look at the lid inside of an Egyptian uh, coffin, You'll see a, a, a woman's face at the top, woman's hands, woman's feet, and then stars where her chest and torso and so forth are. You're looking at the, the sky goddess nut. The deceased would look up at the sky goddess. So the sun god was born every morning as a baby in the uh, a womb of his mother, sky goddess, traveled across the sky, and then after noon, started to age, and at sunset was an old man. 
and died and then journeyed in the celestial bark. They thought the sun god, they thought the sky was actually a sea and he had a ship. By the way, an Egyptian thought this world is a bubble in a cosmic sea. If you kept going out farther, you'd encounter water above and below. The Bible refers to that. God right. opens the firmament of heaven and the waters above fall. Yeah. And he separates the waters above from the waters below. And then the you would travel with the sun god, or I should say the sun god. He then travels across the underworld. And he has to pass through, sometimes it's nine gates, sometimes it's 12 gates. He has no passwords and things to do. To pass, each one has a guard there. And if he's successful navigating the afterlife, I should say the land of the dead, the dead experience, he's reborn in the morning. And that's what the deceased, when they die, they're mummified and they join the sun god in his journey across the underworld. And then in the morning, they come back on earth. The Egyptians thought the dead are all around us. And if they did it properly, they would stay with us. Now, the Egyptians had an interesting concept that nobody is by nature immortal. If you did nothing, you would just turn to ozone and fertilizer. They didn't use those terms, but you'd rot. Yeah. But by using magic, you could conquer death. Interesting, they thought that there was no such thing as natural death. All death was by magic. And if you had an accident, someone worked a spell on you. Yeah. But also you could use magic to live forever. They taught you the passwords. That's what the Egyptian Book of the Dead is. Ah. And in fact, they have three types. There are the pyramid texts, which were found in the pyramid of Unis, these beautiful texts. And by the way, Egypt has the most beautiful writing system ever invented by the human race, the hieroglyphic writing. Oh. And that was for the Pharaoh, the magic words. And then in later times, you have the coffin texts, which were put in for the noble class. And then by the late times, everybody could do this. And you had the Egyptian Book of the Dead typically placed between the knees of the deceased. It was mummified. Now, again, notice the magic. There's two rules of magic. Like causes like. That's called imitative magic. People know about the voodoo doll. You make the image. You hurt the image. You kill or hurt the one it resembles. Mm -hmm. It works in reverse. You make a statue of the person, as long as the statue exists, he will exist. That's why sculptor, ah. in ancient Egyptian, means he who keeps alive. Ah. And then also, if you mention the name of the deceased, this is this I find interesting. They literally thought that if we remember someone's name, he still exists. That's why they would carve it all over the tombs. And here's what's really intriguing. There was a heretic pharaoh named Akhenaten, who yeah. tried to suppress the other god cults and, and uh, only glorify one god, Amun-Ra. By the way, notice Amun sounds like Amen. Mm -hmm. There's been a theory that what Moses actually was, was a priest of Akhenaten, preserving ah. the one god tradition after it was suppressed. After Akhenaten's death, his successor, who oddly enough is Tutankhamun, the one pharaoh they found intact in burial, they restore all the old gods and, and the old traditions. But then the priests tried to destroy his name, his statues, and all evidence of his existence because they believed if they did that, he would no longer exist. They're trying to kill him in the next life. But in the 19th century, late 19th, early 20th century, archaeologists discovered they did their job incorrectly, an inscription with Akhenaten's name. And as soon as he read it, after thousands of years of non-existence, Akhenaten lives now. Ah, You mention his name, he is back. We find this co concept all over the place. It's found in voodoo, the wa. These are voodoo gods. And all of them seem to be dead humans. And as long as they're remembered and served, they get stronger and stronger and stronger. But if they're forgotten, 
they fade away and disappear. Uh, so it's that literally fame is immortality. So I hate to say this because we'll have an Oswald out there doing something <laughs> to gain fame. That's called the immortality of Cain. Uh, there yeah. was an ancient Greek who tried to, he burned down a temple to be remembered forever. And then the Greeks in their, his punishment erased his name, but of course they failed and we remember him. Um, so, um, but um, uh, notice by the way, if this is correct, all of these Holocaust memorials and so forth is actually the wrong thing to do. Because according to the ancient Egyptians, the more you talk about Adolf Hitler, stronger he becomes. Yeah, yeah. In their culture. Oh, that's that's fascinating. So, um, um, but again, and, and by the way, I should also, my just kind of, um, I, I refer to when I do this as verbal diarrhea, so cut me short if I... <laughs> 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 but... Um, one interesting point uh, I was going to mention, oh, regarding Christians, I should mention if the audience, because again, it's predominantly Christian, probably, I would guess, of background. Emanuel Swedenberg had the most beautiful description of Christian afterlife, I think, of virtually anyone who's ever written about it. He was an 18th century Swedish baron and seer. And in fact, Helen Keller was a member of a church that was founded on his teachings uh, William James, the psychologist, and Henry James, the novelist, their father was a minister in the church that followed his teachings. It's called the Church of the New Jerusalem. Uh, sadly, I'm in Ohio. We had a college here that belonged to that church called Urbana University that recently, with all of these problems, closed down. Uh, they had an excellent collection of his writings there, sadly, so it was lost. But at any rate, um, Swedenberg claimed he actually saw the other side, not in glimpses, but in great detail. And I thought if you're going to have a heaven and a hell, his description was quite interesting. He referred to our ruling love. And he said, for example, um, in the afterlife, first of all, you spend, after you die, you spend roughly 30 years at most in what he called the world of spirits. And in the world of spirits, you'll see loved ones, family members, and so forth. But it only lasts about 30 years. And then you gravitate based on your ruling love. And for example, let's say some elderly church woman who's very pious, inoffensive, generous. She's a loving person. So she gravitates towards a heavenly place. And what she'll eventually find, it, she, by the way, Swedenberg made it very clear that most dead people don't realize they're dead ah. because the other world is so similar to this one. You'll see the sun in the sky. You'll see houses. You'll see trees. And this is a widespread notion. So if you're a good, sweet, elderly church woman, you'll find yourself in a beautiful village with wonderful people. But Swedenberg then goes on to say, now imagine a frog in a swamp. The frog is actually happy in the swamp with all the flies and mosquitoes and slime. And if you put the frog in a beautiful pasture, meadow, he's miserable. He wants to be in the slime with all the mosquitoes. And according to Swedenberg, the evil people, because of their ruling love, gravitate towards the hellish realms mm -hmm. and they live what looks like an urban slum and they steal from one another and they hurt each other and they rape each other. And uh, oddly enough, Alistair Crowler, the occultist once said he wanted to go to a place where there's crime and basically promiscuity. That's what he would get, but they're not damned to that place. They willingly go there. And they're happy there. I mean, that's what they want to be, like the frog in the swamp. Yeah. And then Swedenborg goes on to say that this world, our faces are based on our parents. But in the next world, our faces are based on our ruling love. So the elderly church lady will have a beautiful young face in the next world. But the evil person in this hellish realm is repulsive in appearance because his ruling love is hatred and violence and crime. And Swedenberg says that's why hell is dark. 
because God in his mercy, he doesn't want these people to see what they really look like. But heaven is bright and beautiful. It's just a really, he has a work called Heaven and Hell. That if your audience, if they're interested in this, can read about it. Um, Swedenberg. Yes, Emanuel yeah. Swedenberg. Uh, yep. Interesting character. And again, I'm pointing out, even within Christianity itself, there's a wide variety of notions. What happens, what occurs, and if you get in traditional religions, if you get into other world religions, um, it's it's there's a, just an endless supply. And and I also mentioned that remember I said at the start, even if God doesn't exist, we may actually have an afterlife. Now that people will find that is how does that work? Well, one notion is in fact the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche was interested in this. It's called the eternal recurrence. And Poincaré, mathematician, was interested in it. He said, well, he said that if uh, if time is eternal and there's only finite possibilities, imagine if you've lived forever and you're throwing 600 dice onto a table or even 6,000 dice, eventually the exact same throw, the same configuration has to occur. Mm -hmm. You throw it over and over and over again. Huxley famously said, if you put a chimpanzee in front of a keyboard and he randomly hits the keys, he will eventually type all the key, uh, all the shades of plays of Shakespeare. And he will over eternity. So according to the eternal recurrence, we die here, according to Nietzsche, but then eventually time is this great circle. And everything has to repeat exactly. So it may be a billions or trillions of years, but eventually this universe comes back and we'll have this program again. We'll be talking. We've done it an infinite number of times already and an infinite number of times in the future. So you don't even need an immortal soul to live forever. But according to the eternal recurrence, You'll live the same 80 some years, whatever, over and over and over again. Well, you won't, it'll be fresh. Each time you do it, you're the same person in the same situation, so you'll make the same choices. Um, Uspensky, a Russian follower of Gurdjieff, wrote a wonderful novel based on the eternal recurrence. And I suddenly forget the name of the novel. But this character um, is actually. Um, realizes this is going on. He makes a couple of crucial mistakes and he gets the opportunity to go back and have another to do it again, but he, he can't help himself. He makes the same mistakes <laughs> again, even though he knows these are, for example, he plays a childish prank that gets him expelled from school and he'll do it again the next time. So I wish I could remember the name of the novel, but it's by uh, uh, Uspensky. So, um, but this yeah. is the, the ultimate question. Go ahead. I, I often thought, uh, and, and by the way, I used to be a vice president of Puget Sound Christian College as well. Uh, so I'm a faith-based guy, even though I was always the kid asking the, the strange questions in Sunday school, you know, <laughs> what's up with these giants in the Bible and, you know, the UFOs that they seem to, uh, describe as well. Um, but I often thought that if I was um, if I was God, the big G God, and I'm sitting there creating uh, my own universe or a universe that I uh, exist in, uh, it it might get a little boring after a while. Why not create uh, you know versions of yourself or at least sparks of yourself to go out and experience various things, not just good but bad and all sorts of uh, strange uh, experiences that you might not uh, normally uh, experience. Of course, you, you would argue that God has experienced everything, but you, you wonder that the idea that uh, we actually go out and, like you said, uh, become uh, an evil person and do it very good, you know, that kind of a thing, might be a purpose actually to our existence rather than, trying to always be the best person we could be. Yes, almost certainly. In fact, they used to discuss this in post-Darwin era. It seemed that, we now dismiss this now, that some of the early researchers in evolution were saying that perhaps evil serves a purpose 
And um, and frankly, oddly enough, not to go back to the Mormons again, but actually that's what they say happened, is that, first of all, the Mormons say that we've not been created. We've always existed. This is kind of shocking, again, to Orthodox Christians. Uh -huh. But we find that in Jainism, this idea. That's a Hindu religion. Oddly enough, we find it in Sci Scientology, the Thetan. We've always existed. And um, Mormons teach that God decided to give us a chance to go to this highest heaven. But the only way we could do that was to we had to be born in bodies with free choice. So that's what this is all about. We had an opportunity. If we don't, we could just stay as like spirit children or we could be born in bodies and get more exalted. Uh, so that's what the whole universe is about. And also your point about boredom is interesting because, again, Nietzsche said uh, boredom, even the gods struggle against it in vain. And I should mention that we throw around eternity, the term. Yeah. And people don't realize if you live, for exist for trillions of years, if I go to a heaven and I'm there for two trillion years, wouldn't that eventually corrupt me? The endless bliss and power? And we find that concept in Eastern religions. Um, they say, this again is confusing to Westerners, there's always a God named Shiva and a God named Vishnu. But it's not always the same God. What happens is if you do something, a supreme act of generosity can cause me to be reborn my next life as a God. And I can even become Shiva. And if I be, I'll be the God himself. And I'll be this God for millions of years. But the Hindus teach that ultimately gods are corrupted by bliss and power. And they die. Eventually, after 200 million years or so, they die and typically fall because they've been corrupted. And then someone else becomes Shiva. There's always a Shiva, always a Vishnu, but it keeps changing who, who is this entity. There's a wonderful story where Vishnu and Shiva are talking and they see ants crossing along the ground. And I believe in this particular tale, it's Vishnu talking to Shiva. He says, do you see all those ants? Those were Shiva, all previously Shiva. <laughs> um, if you crush a cockroach, you may, it may have once been a god. And um, that's why Buddhists say you must be kind to all things because, for example, that dog barking at you may have been your mother at one time in a previous life. And they, the mother symbolizes on Mother's Day, in Eastern thought, the ultimate generosity. She carries you in stress and pain for nine months, gives birth in pain. And uh, she does this with really nothing to benefit herself personally. So the mother becomes the symbol of generosity. And, um, oh, while I'm on it too, I should make the connection, which again you see in the Bible, the connection between sex and death. Now again, Christians, I think, tend to misread this, although the rabbis seem to be on the money on it. In ancient Hebrew, the verb to know is the same verb for to have sex with. So when we translate in King James Bible version, Abraham knew his wife. That's actually a correct translation. And what the rabbis say, you had the two trees in Eden, the tree of life that kept him alive, and the tree of knowledge. And they say that's sexual knowledge. Ah. And what happened was when Eve tasted the fruit, she had sex. By the way, there's even a tradition in, in, in these earlier traditions, she has sex with the serpent. The Kabbalah says that. He injected filth into her. And typically in many traditions, that's Cain as a result. Cain's uh -huh. actually the half-brother. She then, of, of, of Abel, she then has sex with Adam, produces uh, Abel, and also later Seth, and But it's interesting, if you look at nature, as soon as sexual reproduction occurs, death occurs. Bacteria never grow old and die. They can be killed, 
with your Lysol, but they never grow old and die. Ah. But as soon as you get into multicellular organisms and sexual reproduction, death happens. Yeah. In fact, in humans, we have the hay flick limit, was discovered in the 1960s. Our cells were only reproduce, well, will duplicate so many times, and then it stops. It's as if we are wired to die. We are designed to die. Yeah. And, and when the story rings true, which reminds me too, is that's why there have been some extremist groups in Christianity who claim that all sex leads to death. The Shakers, who followed Mother Ann Lee, the interesting prophet from 18th century, who, by the way, the Shakers believed uh, the United Brethren in the second uh, coming of Christ is their official name, I believe. They believe that the Christ came first as a man, Jesus, and then returned as a woman in the 18th century. Ah. Oh. And now they don't think the Christ was God. Um, they have one God, and the Christ was kind of, a, a, shall we say, a metaphor, a symbol. We must model our life on Jesus and on Mother Ann Lee. But Mother Ann Lee taught that the origin of all sin is sex. That's why the Shakers were celibates. No sex was allowed. They were so strict. They lived in communes. You, a man could not even walk on the stairs at the same time as a woman. They could never touch, including shaking hands. Um, and they thought that pure virginity and celibacy led to salvation. Another interesting point about the Shakers, modern uh, Christians will often, the minister will say, um, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, Jesus still loves us. The Shakers followed the Gospel of Matthew, which clearly Jesus says, you must be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. He didn't say, go out and there be, uh, uh, you know, into promiscuity and then I'll forgive you. If you. Remember when he forgives the adulteress, he says, go and sin no more. Yeah. We always forget that part. <laughs> um, right. I'm always amazed by college students. I remember, um, again, I'm really old. That's why. It, but I remember a young lady in my class was talking. And she said, we we're is in my alternative religions class. And she said, my boyfriend just won't go to church. And when I wake up on Sunday morning, I, I turn over and wake him up. But he won't get out of bed to go to church. <laughs> Didn't <laughs> occur to her that she shouldn't have been in bed with him before going to church. But again, our modern culture is, uh, speaking of which, I, I, I got married at a really late age and just six years ago. And yeah. um, a much younger wife, I'm down in Southern Ohio. All, all the all the young men are in jail, so I can get pick of the litter. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, uh, we went through one of the traditional services we went to an Anglican communion. The minister, it's a woman, looks at us and said, you haven't lived together? You're the first prequel I've ever married and haven't lived together. Yeah. So, it, kind of curious. Uh, but at any rate, I should also mention the Scopsi. They're, they're a curious Russian sect. Really? Um, they again thought Christ returned in the 18th century in the form, in this case, a man. And they actually taught the baptism by fire. And what this was, now remember, um, John the Baptist says that I baptize with water. The one who will follow me will baptize with fire. Yeah. Now, oddly enough, this will shock your audience. We have some evidence that it, this is not orthodoxy, that Jesus and his apostles may have been eunuchs, castrated themselves. Oh, my. It sounds unbelievable. Jesus even says in Matthew, if your hand cause you to sin, cut it off. If your eye cause you to sin, pluck it out. Mm -hmm. And those who can become eunuchs do so for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And what the Scopsi believe, they practice baptism by fire. They burn off their genitals. And the men are all, the, the women will burn off the breasts and also the clitoris. And then the men will burn off their genitals completely. And they believe they're guaranteed uh, salvation if they do that. Um, and they wow. would meet at night in secret and they would dance. It's really interesting. 
that um, celibate groups, virgin groups like the Shakers, yeah. who did, who did, they they didn't castrate themselves, but they they had aesthetic dancing. Yeah, and uh, often human emotion will redirect itself elsewhere. Like if the you, sexual passion will be redirected into something else. In this case, both groups would have ecstatic dancing. So, um, so again, wide variety of notions of how to get. Probably, if I were God and some guy burned off his genitals to get in, I'd probably let him in. Say, okay, that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, quite a quite a commitment. That's for sure. Um, you know the the idea though of uh, celibacy uh, sect. Um, it it I mean. How, how did they understand that that would uh, that that would continue? I mean, isn't it quite self-limiting, you know, to be able to even think of that kind of a dogma? Well, in fact, you're right on the money, and they they knew this, and they said, for example, if you go way back in the early church fathers, Saint uh, Jerome says that marriage populates the earth, but virginity fills heaven, and the early Christian church fathers did promote virginity. The notion that marriage is a sacrament in Catholicism takes a thousand years. The notion that the Protestants have that a legitimate marriage with a wife and children is, a, is God's calling, that's a, that's a relatively recent development. The early Christians said, marry if you can't resist your passions. That's why Paul says, uh, it's better to marry than to burn. He means burn with lust. Mm -hmm. But if you, it's best to become a monk or a nun or a celibate. Now, as you're right, if everybody uh, did this, the world would die out. But frankly, remember, they welcomed this. Um, the idea that endless copulation causing birth and sin, they thought if everybody became virginal and the world becomes extinct, we could all, it would end and we'd all be in heaven. Oh, which reminds me, that little story, during the Cold War, a Christian minister of the United States visited a Russian Orthodox church, this is in the 1970s, and attended a service. And he noticed during the service that everyone in the church was either an, uh, uh, an old person or a child. And after the congregation filed out, the Christian minister walked up to the Orthodox priest and said, aren't you alarmed? All you have in your congregation are old people and some children. And the priest replied, there are always old people and children. <laughs> so, um, by the way, the Shakers, when they established their communes, um, their farms, they adopted children. And uh, oh. They took orphans and raised them as shakers, but you got the right to leave at age 18. And many people did, but they raised them as shakers and then you could leave. And oddly enough, um, uh, Mother Ann Lee made a really curious prophecy. She predicted that her movement would eventually become virtually extinct. She said it would become so small, there wouldn't be enough shakers. She didn't call them that. There wouldn't be enough believers to carry one coffin. Mm. Then it'll grow again. And last I look, they they're down to about five members. They're they still exist, but they're all, and they're all old. And oddly enough, they're not apparently accepting new members because on paper, they're multimillionaires. They live in simple farmhouses, baking their own bread sweeping their own floors and but they're on paper they own all kinds of real estate and they're afraid that someone will join just to get the money for obvious reasons mm -hmm. con men um but it's it's a shame how often um uh you can manipulate human belief to um steal from them i'm not just talking about the shakers i'm talking about in in general that's why you know a standard um uh, uh, character and sort of anti-religious fiction is the you know fast-talking uh, uh, fake evangelist who talks the gospel but is actually a con man. Yeah. Um, and sadly, although um, 
you know, another course I have is on crime and terrorism. You know why it's actually dangerous to donate to charity at some level? No. Well, it's rather interesting because the organized crime often penetrates charities. Yeah. And the reason they do that is because they understand when you make an investment, you're going to watch the money. But when people donate to charity, they no longer pay attention to it. Ah. They're giving up the money. That's why you'll heavily often see uh, heavy. And I'm not trying to tell your audience not to donate to charity, but be careful the charities you donate to, because often they're fronts for criminal activity. Um, and uh, there, there are some legitimate ones, but be careful. Uh, yeah. Remember the, some of the scandals we have with uh, wounded veterans and so forth. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 Um, which yeah. reminds me, too, I don't know if they've changed this, but until recently, if a, if a soldier dies in war, their family gets about a half a million dollars. There's an insurance policy. Really? Now, I don't know if they've changed it, but that was the case for years. Um, and so why these people would be financially distressed because the husband was killed. In fact, we had a case in Detroit area some years ago where a woman married to a soldier conspired with another soldier to kill her husband. The other soldier was her lover mm -hmm. and they were going to kill the husband to collect the money. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, that would be a pretty natural scheme for sure. Yes. Oh, by the way, the next time we have a huge terror attack like 9-11, you're going to see all kinds of people. Uh, this actually happened in 9-11. People would fake their death. So they, the family could get the money? Yeah, I'll bet. And oh, my. They didn't talk about it in the news, but it certainly was far more common. If yeah. you're supposed to be at work in the World Trade Center when it collapsed, and it did collapse, you call your spouse and say, uh, I'll be, I'll go to Mexico and disappear, and you file a claim. Yeah, yeah. So there's always a con somewhere. Oh boy, that would be uh, that would be a strange Netflix uh, documentary, wouldn't it? You know, all the different expats that are collecting, uh, <laughs> you know, money from uh, disasters around the world. Oh, by the way, I should mention because I'm talking mafia. I've got the Italian name, so just let you know I'm not in the mafia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although oh, nice. What one, one joke I use is someone will ask me because I went to a European University, University of Glasgow in Scotland, yeah. to University of Virginia. And they'll say, this is a small school. Like, why are you at Shawnee State University? It's a really small school. And my pat answer, it's a joke, of course. I say, and it helps to have the Italian name. I'll say, witness protection program. They'll never find me here. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good answer. I love that cloak and dagger kind of stuff for sure. Um, well, that's fascinating stuff. Oh, I'm I'm really enjoying our conversations here tonight. I mean, the, the, you you don't really think about uh, the afterlife, uh, or or what other cultures have thought of the afterlife. You just pretty much go through, kind of like a uh, a frame of reference that you've been taught throughout your lifetime, and I think it's refreshing to find out uh, and and to kind of like correlate various, uh, you know. Uh, culture's uh, belief in this regard, because it's such a mysterious idea that we don't end potentially uh, upon death and there's something else afterward. By the way, I should mention, because we have research by Dr. Raymond Moody, who wrote the famous book, Life After Life. And he was an MD who also had, I think it was either a philosophy degree, I think it was philosophy degree, PhD in philosophy. But he noticed as a physician, People had that were clinically dead and then brought back were selling, telling similar stories, mm -hmm. like seeing entities of light and so forth. And he collected them. The book became a bestseller in the 1970s, Life After Life. What's interesting, though, what he describes, if the Tibetans are correct, is actually he made an error. And what the Tibetans say, they have a wonderful book that in English is called the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh, that's not really its name, but we call it in English. And they describe the entire death process, which lasts these three bardo states up to 49 days. And what they describe is um, 
when you first die, you encounter the clear light of the void. And it's light that's brighter than a thousand suns and louder than a thousand thunderstrikes. And most people will shrink back. But if you do that, you'll continue the journey and you won't <clears throat> escape rebirth. And then he, the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead describes, for example, people will see themselves outside their body. And some people will try to re-enter the body, which is a bad idea. Other people will um, they'll notice outside their body, for example, they think they can fly, they'll fly. And they can do wonderful things. And the Tibetan Book of the Dead says, do not do that. And, and by the way, the endless advice is to remain completely indifferent. Don't be afraid and don't be attracted to anything. Just remain calm. And then the Tibetan Book of the Dead describes, you'll see visions. And it's based on your belief system. If you're a Muslim, you'll see, for example, Gabriel, the angel. If you're a Christian, you'll see St. Peter or Jesus. And they, they openly believe this in Tibet. You'll actually see what you expect again. And they say, do not be drawn to the entities because they're not really there. What you're experiencing is a dream. But remember, they say this world's a dream. So it's equally real, but it's a dreamlike state. And you must remain calm. And then after about seven, eight, nine days, you start to experience horrific things. You'll see what look like demons ripping out your intestines, ripping off your head, pursuing you. And the Tibet Book of the Dead says, remain calm. They're not really there. This is interesting because we've had some clinically dead people who described seeing beautiful beings and others who described Rawlings wrote a book on, he was a pious Christian who collected hellish experiences. He said, look, a lot of people think they're in hell, but the Tibetans say neither one of these is actually happening. And then you think you're on a journey, but you're not, it's all a dream. And then you eventually, uh, if you don't escape the wheel of rebirth, you go to one of six possible levels of existence. And um, the book describes what you'll see. For example, everyone who's a human saw humans copulating. And if we were men drawn to the woman and repulsed by the man, um, we basically become men. And if we're the reverse, we become women. And what we were seeing were our parents having sex, strangely enough. Ah. And then they, they describe um, if you go to a hellish realm, if you go to a uh, animal realm, if you go to a God realm, they'll say what you'll see. For example, the God realm looks like a palace. And um, what you'll see, and they, they give instructions what decision to make. That's interesting because the Orphic texts from ancient Greece tell people what passwords to say and where to go in the next world to go to a, a more glamorous afterlife. Uh, and while I'm on it, by the way, probably one of the most uh, curious afterlifes would be the Aztecs from Mexico. Ordinary people will undertake a journey that lasts four years. And when they died, they would kill a dog those chihuahuas, and um, bury the person with the dog. And then they would take this um, journey for four years and then turn to mud. But those who died in battle or on the sacrificial stone or women who died in childbirth, that was the female equivalent of battle, joined the sun in the journey across the sky. Ah. It's a classic yeah. example of the society trying to encourage certain behavior. Die as a warrior, as a mother, or as a sacrificial victim. Uh, there was one Aztec tale. They captured this great warrior hero from a neighboring city-state. And he was going to be sacrificed. And then the Aztecs were attacked. And this guy, this man was such a great fighter, they asked him to help in the battle. And he did. And then the story is after he helped them win, 
They said, well, we'll let you go home now because you helped us. But he demanded the right to be sacrificed. He wanted to join the son in his journey. Wow. Um, which yeah. reminds me, the, the Mayans have a really curious tale. If you hang, don't, don't do this if you're the audience, but if you hang yourself, you go to a, a goddess. So it's it's really, although in most cultures, like in Europe, you know why they practiced on the Nuremberg criminals hanging? No. See, in European culture, that's the worst. That's a low class felon's death. Ah. The An upper class, right? Uh, they thought the bloody death with the axe was the upper class death or firing squad. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the hanging is for lower class. Now, in America, this all got confused. We had states that were hanging everybody. Uh, and no matter what, you know, who they were and what they had done. Whereas in Europe, there was a clear distinction based on social class. That's why the French Revolution introduced the guillotine, gave every Frenchman the right to die the aristocratic death. They oh, that's that fascinating. An, yeah, thought that was an honor. Well, they not only hanged the Nuremberg criminals, they photographed them naked afterward with nooses around their neck. It's just curious how war can generate. <laughs> Obviously, these people did some bad things, but war just generates such hatred. It's just... Uh, you can't imagine doing that today, but yeah, um, yeah. It was a, a titanic struggle. Um, why, why do you suppose uh, cultures around the world uh, are so fascinated with the idea of uh, of life after death? Uh, you you would think that that's not necessarily something that. Um, uh, would would be taught or uh, would be beneficial to a society. Well, maybe it would be beneficial to a society uh, if there was a better thing that uh, you were supposed to go to after death if you uh, towed the line, in other words. Well, yes. Now, the advanced civilization, that's the case. If you tow the line, you go to a better place. Now, remember, I want to make it very clear. In most traditional cultures, everybody goes to the same place. Ah. And in ancient Babylon, even, uh, everyone went to Aralu, kings, slaves, uh, rich, poor, good, evil, all went to the same place. And then over time, you get the development, for example, in the Greek world of mystery cults. The Greeks thought everybody went to the same place, Hades. But this confuses us because we use Hades for hell. It's simply a boring um, underworld. Uh, I always tell, just imagine in subterranean Indianapolis. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's not really a place where you're going to be tortured to the Greeks. They did have a place of torture called Tartarus, but it's only be, it's not for evil people. It's people who had annoyed the gods, entities. Also, the Titans, who were the old gods, Zeus imprisoned them there. They're there as POWs, not because they're evil. Well, then the Greeks introduced these mystery cults. If you did, you had certain knowledge, you went through an initiation, and then you were would become a more glamorous, glorious afterlife. In fact, anyone, this is what the Romans thought. When they first encountered Christianity, they viewed it as a Greek mystery cult from the East. In fact, even the scriptures are in Greek, the New Testament writings. And the early Christians met in secret. Uh, you couldn't walk into a Christian uh, church. They met at night, which to the Romans was unusual. Uh, originally, they met at night because they were harassed. Um, <clears throat> but to the Romans, you always honored the gods by day, never by night. And if you honored them by night, you were actually honoring the dead. So that's why the Romans viewed this as uh, the uh, uh, cult to the dead Galilean. Ah, And remember to the Romans, um, very literally, I'm not trying to offend anybody here, but to the Roman mindset now, Jesus died at not only a horrible death, but the death reserved for what they considered the worst type of felon. Yeah. He died the equivalent of the Nuremberg trial death. Yeah. Speaking yeah, definitely. Which, he was stark naked when he's nailed to the cross. Mm -hmm. He's beaten. Uh, he's nailed to the cross naked. There's a scene in the Gospels where somebody tries to give him vinegar and gall on a sponge. 
And everybody misses the significance of that. In a Roman latrine, they had public latrines. They don't have toilet paper. They used sponge on a stick in vinegar. Somebody ah. is mocking him, sticking basically from a, a, a public restroom in his face. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and my. So, but very literally, this is again how strange history is. Someone who dies in an obscure corner of the Roman Empire ends up, well, in fact, as again, I keep quoting Nietzsche, but I, I love him as a philosopher. He said the Romans annihilated uh, the Judaic state and the Jewish people a couple times, they even outlawed Jews in Jerusalem. Yet he said today, people bow down to a Jewish man in Rome. He's referring to St. Peter's, mm -hmm. Jesus. And that shows the power of ideas. You can crush people, but the ideas are important. In fact, I wish we'd figure this out, fighting these wars against the Taliban and Islam. This is not how you defeat ideas. Yeah. Um, you kill them. It just puts gasoline on the struggle. Uh, but, of course, we've got the people at the Pentagon are not taking my history courses. This is why we're in such trouble. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, that's that's for sure. Um, it, seems, <laughs> it's, it seems like uh, the mistakes are just made over and over again, for sure. Yes. Um, uh, and by the way, I wanted to mention some other points here. I'm trying to think what else we should um, work in, but the wide... Oh, I know what I should mention, just in case. Um, um, the concept of ghost. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I should point out, now again, Here's what's really curious, why modern people are terrified of ghosts. You shouldn't be. It's evidence of some post-death existence, so you should give you joy. Mm -hmm. Second point, in English tradition, if you see a ghost, the next morning, start digging there. There's a common English tradition that the ghost is someone that's entity hanging around treasure. So if you see oh. a ghost, look for... Maybe some uh, savings bonds or American money buried in the walls yeah. somewhere. Also, uh, don't be afraid of ghosts because all if you are terrified, all you have to do is throw a handful of earth at its face. And you'll have to obey you. Oh. So, again, why all this terror is, is beyond me, uh, which reminds me, because I study the unusual, and I'm always open. I never laugh at, ridicule, or criticize. Uh, I like to listen to various concepts. And one of the strangest phone calls I ever received, interesting. When I say strange, I mean interesting. Uh-huh. This woman called me in the 1990s, I forget the exact year, in my office. And she had a daughter who was, she claimed, possessed by a devil and was clearly terrified. This mother was talking. And the first thing I said was, is your daughter roughly uh, going through puberty? And she was stunned that I said that because that's exactly what was going on. Yeah. You see, in traditional cultures, uh, that's a time of great um, change and stress. And also, normally when the paranormal occurs, it occurs at thresholds. Right. Birth, death, puberty, this kind of thing. Well, then the woman proceeds to tell me some of the details, including this girl was um, a deaf mute, and she had a computer device that would help her to communicate, and she could type in things that would speak for her. This is in mm -hmm. the 1990s. Yeah. And I immediately said, is the entity communicating through the device? And she was stunned that I knew that. Again, this is very common. The notion of haunted technology is very common. And the device would turn on by itself. She said she unplugged it. And it would still, um, the, the message would come across. And apparently the girl had come home from school and her father had hanged himself in the backyard. She's 13 years old and sees her father hanging from a tree suicide. And the entity on the uh, device was saying, uh, I'm your father, I'm in hell, and kill yourself and join me in hell, this kind of thing. 
and swearing constantly and all this sort of thing. And of course, I kept telling this lady, I can tell you the lore, the traditions. I won't tell you what to do. I'll just tell you what the beliefs are. Mm -hmm. And rule one is you never listen to these entities. Uh, there, by the way, if you encounter a ghost, it's the same thing. Um, they lie. Uh, in fact, that's why in tradition, you try to force the ghost or spirit into a triangle. They must tell the truth inside a triangle. Oh. That's why in old Ouija boards, you'll see a triangle on the mm. planchette. I bet these new ones, they don't know that, so they dropped it. But the old ones will have a triangle. He must speak the truth. At any rate, to condense the story of this possession, I told the woman, ignore. It's not her father talking to her. Ignore everything he says. And I said, basically, um, change locations. And she, she was puzzled by that because she said, that's true. Whenever we leave, the hauntings only occur at this particular house. And when we leave, they stop. And uh, when we come back, uh, they continue. So I suggested to her that she leave and then gave her some further advice. And uh, curious, again, this is probably arrogant ego at work. I was thinking, how did this woman find me? So at the very end of the conversation, I said, and we talked about an hour and a half. I said, by the way, um, how did you find me? And I was thinking she would say, I've countered your books or whatever. And she replied, I've called over 20 universities and colleges not a single one, including religious colleges, Christian colleges, would talk to me. And I was just going down the list through Ohio and Pennsylvania. She apparently lived in western Pennsylvania. And she said, I randomly called your school, the central uh, switchboard, and they transferred me to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, apparently our operator was, oh, demonic possession, please hold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I can I can relate a little bit that to uh, my my own bar association has monikered me as the paranormal lawyer, and I uh, typically will get strange calls and referrals from uh, other attorneys. <laughs> oh, interesting! <laughs> with you strange really... with strange cases as well. Um, but I know I I kind of enjoy that. Like you said, there's uh, no not a a lot of uh, people that are willing to. Uh, Look! Look at the whole um, issue of the paranormal critically at all. <clears throat> you know, I think most people just try to dismiss it. And uh, they, matter of fact, you know, I've I've always not understood why the right wing Christian community out there just doesn't want to uh, even talk about UFOs or anything because they're supposedly demonic, but they don't do anything about it. You know, they just want to stay away from it rather than, you know, try to uh, figure out how they're going to deal with uh, you know, something that's demonic or, you know, Satan or whatever. Um, uh, you would think that uh, as a, a soldier of Christ, you would want to uh, try to do something positive, you know, and against that kind of uh, darkness. So I've always wondered about that, you know, in, in society as well. By the way, there's an interesting hmm. book, and I'm trying to remember the author's name, he was an American who went to the University of Edinburgh. And he wrote a work, I think it's called Flying Saucers in the Bible. Oh. And it was published in the 1960s. And what's interesting about it, I want to make it very clear, this man was a pious Presbyterian. In fact, mm -hmm. I think he actually studied, I think he was a minister. And the thesis of his book was that there were, Christianity is actually, and Judaism as well, Judeo-Christian traditions, are the real religion, the true religion. But long ago, missionaries from another planet came here. And he said that when you see in the Bible an angel, that's actually a missionary. Ah. But because their technology was so advanced, the people in the, in the ancient world thought they were angels. And he said, for example, it's interesting. Remember, Moses has leprosy, and his sister Miriam has leprosy. But the Bible describes that as there, he he gets leprosy, can make his hand leprous to, as a miracle, and his sister gets it when she criticizes him, um, his marriage. But the Bible describes leprosy as his hand is as white as snow. That's ah. not like leprosy to me. <clears throat> and um, 
it's been suggested for years, roughly 20% of ancient Hebrew words were of uncertain definition that were mistranslating that. And I think this fellow's name may be Barry Downing. He said those were radiation burns. They really weren't leprosy. People yeah. got too close to the alien craft. He says Ezekiel's wheel is a flying uh, craft. And he says that um, whenever you see a cloud in the Bible, this is one of their devices. But interesting notion. And he's saying right. basically these were missionaries from another world teaching the true faith. But the people didn't understand the missionaries and mistook them. Which reminds me, you know, Battlestar Galactica, the original series? Yes, my, my brother did the costumes for that television show. Oh, wow. And of Gil, course, Gil, Gil Gerard and those guys, yeah. Well, you know, that's based on a Mormon worldview. Is that right? Yeah, they're looking for the, see, the Mormons claim. <laughs> Notice they make reference to gods. Mm -hmm. They're looking for the 13th tribe. I think they've kind of messed it up in the remake, but in the original series, it's written by a pious Mormon. What was his name? Larson, I believe. Gary Larson. Oh, okay. He's a Mormon, and he inserts Mormon belief. See, the Mormons believe mm -hmm. there are millions of gods in the universe. They only worship one. Mm -hmm. so there's millions of gods. Because if you achieve the highest heaven, you become a god. And uh, they say right. that our god is from Kolob. The planet Kola, the one we yeah. worship, right? And but it, you'll see a Mormon worldview cleverly inserted into the program. In fact, there's also that. Um, what's that? Um, is that the Twilight series with the vampire? The the, mm -hmm. the original mm -hmm. one is written by a, a Mormon lady. That's why there's no sex. Like she she yeah. falls in love mm -hmm. for the. They probably changed that in the later version. I've never seen it. I just saw the first one. Yeah, but um, it's written by a Mormon lady, so it's interesting to insert their worldview into yeah. the system. Oh yeah. So your 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 uh, brother worked on the original series. The original series with a uh, matter of fact, I don't know if you remember on that show. Oh, I love that show. There was a character, a little uh, mechanical dog called a Daggett, that was actually a, a monkey a chimpanzee that my brother had to dress up into this costume every day. Uh, whenever they use the Daggett in the scene, um, I, 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 I spent like 10 years working around in at Universal Studios myself when my brother and I were down there in Hollywood. So I've got a whole bunch of uh, tour guide trivia when I was a tour guide <laughs> at Universal that I can tell you about. But Battlestar Galactica was one of my faves. Did you dislike the remake or did you like it? Um, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't really, I wasn't really into it at that point. So I didn't have a whole lot of, you know, uh, one way or another th thoughts of the thing. I just knew uh, of the, the old uh, television series guys, you know, that only that series only lasted, I think it was one season, one or half, one or two seasons at the most. And it was cut, uh, and dropped very quickly. So it was, um, it was just kind of, you know, one of those things that came and went back in the, I believe it was the seventies, uh, That's that nice I was, stuff. yeah. And by the way, I, I just recently read, I'd forgotten that I'm old enough to remember it, but that Star Trek was canceled within a couple of weeks of the moonwalk first landing on the moon. Oh, wow. You think <laughs> that would have generated interest in space travel, but it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of curious how, um, uh, although sometimes I'm, I love it when things don't go on forever because they they tend to wreck the stories after a while. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's they only run out of plot lines. Uh, only so much you can do. Like uh, you know, I don't know that the X Files, you know, could could stay fresh. You know, uh, for many more seasons after they quit after two hundred and two episodes or something like that. <laughs> and yeah. have you ever have you ever filed a lawsuit based on paranormal? claims? Um, no, I have not, but, um, I typically will have, uh, people come and tell me, uh, some historical, uh, cases that were based on the paranormal that I, I, I always like to relate every once in a while. I'll just tell you, uh, a couple of them. Uh, but one, one was an, an actual ghost, uh, who was instrumental in, 
uh, convicting uh, someone of a capital murder crime. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and this was like in the turn of the century, or early 1900s, where um, a young woman was uh, killed. Uh, they couldn't find her body. Uh, she was missing. Uh, her her mother, uh, you know, after a few days, of course, everybody was trying to find her and everything. Her mother supposedly gets uh, has a dream where she's visited by her daughter in the dream. And the daughter is telling her uh, what happened, who killed her, where she's buried, uh, the manner of her death and all that. Uh, sure enough, the um, the mother, uh, you know, tells this to the police and the prosecutors and stuff. And of course, she's immediately uh, thought of being as a perpetrator herself, you know, knowing all of this. But in reality, uh, during the whole uh, trial, uh, they ended up um, also uh, putting the uh, accused killer from the dream uh, on the stand, and he uh, ended up confessing. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea being that uh, the the mother supposedly got information through her daughter of uh, you know how she was killed, and it was uh, actually admitted into a a court of law. Uh, the, the, the second one is more modern and it's the fact that, uh, you know, um, r real estate law is very, um, cognizant of the fact that if someone dies on a property is supposedly supposed to be disclosed. And in reality, a guy, uh, was moving to a new, new town and he had to buy a house real quick and he purchased this old Victorian place. He thought it was kind of nice. The um, realtor uh, told him about it. It was a good price. And uh, come to find out when he moved into the house, he swears the thing was haunted. And he wants to rescind his contract based on the fact that the house went haunted. <laughs> and, and he goes to court. And literally, uh, this court, um, long story short, uh, rules, of course, they put on, you know, the stand local witnesses and everything. Everybody agrees that this house has been haunted forever. And uh, everyone should have known that, including the real estate agent. And of course, the court rules that as a matter of law, this house being haunted and not disclosed beforehand allowed him to rescind the contract. So that was the first case that I've ever ran across where a court of law makes a ruling that a house is actually haunted. There's a there's a spell in voodoo in Haiti <laughs> where a person who wants to buy a house cheap, he will and someone dies in the house. Mm -hmm. It involves not only a voodoo spell, but you you pound two coffin nails into wood in the basement, into the foundation, and it will trap the deceased in the house. Oh, so it's to make the house haunted. And then after the house is haunted, the new the person who does the spell buys the house cheaply and then removes the nails, does a reverse spell, and now has a cheap house with no ghost. <laughs> oh, and I should mention oh. your your audience too, because there's so much disinformation about uh, ghosts and so on because of the media and films. Uh, first of all, the intelligent ghost, and incidentally, 19th century scholars studied this and they were kind of puzzled that. Most hauntings seem unintelligent. The the entity does the same thing over again, over and over again. Mm -hmm. Walks down a stairwell, is a hitchhiker, carries their head on a platter, mm -hmm. and they said this is not really an entity. Uh, they they called it, for example, one theory was it was an astral corpse. The body is left behind, the mind soul left, but also another soul stays behind. That's what you're seeing. It's what the Egyptians would call the Ka. They had a similar notion. Uh -huh. Part of the deceased stayed behind in the tomb. Well, um, in fact, when someone dies, and you mentioned the murder solved, um, within usually within 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours, the intelligent communications occur. If you have a relative trying to tell you where the will is, where the money's buried, who killed them, that's called a wraith. W-R-A-I-T-H, and they're trying to reach out to their loved ones to give them a warning or information. 
when Dante, the poet, died, he allegedly appeared to his son as a wraith and told his son where part of the divine comedy was hidden. Some of the cantos were missing. And he allegedly told his son they were inside of a wall of a house, which the Dante, his family, no longer lived there. So the son got permission, searched, and found the lost cantos. Now, again, did this occur? Well, it's an interesting story. Now, having said this, the way Hollywood depicts ghosts like you see through them, if you can see through a ghost, it's an aging ghost getting ready to disappear. Ah. That's why it's translucent. Real ghosts will appear absolutely solid and three-dimensional. Okay. And uh, if it's if you see through it, it's a dying, fading ghost. In a lot of traditions, they will haunt when their natural lifetime ends. In other words, if they were murdered at age 20, mm -hmm. and they were supposed to live to age 90, they will walk for 70 years. That's in some traditions. Ah. Um Although it could, again, just be the astral corpse concept. Uh, some traditional cultures argue it's the shadow of your soul that you're seeing as a ghost, that you have a light shadow and a dark shadow. The light shadow goes elsewhere. The dark shadow stays around mm -hmm. the grave. Another widespread notion is as long as the body is still exists, it hasn't completely decomposed, the ghost can still exist. That's why... Cremation typically is an attempt to make certain the deceased does not return. Ah, You burn the body so he can't come back. Often the powerful dead, they thought the powerful dead would return. They're too strong to remain dead. Yeah. If you go to Northern Europe among the Vikings, their ghosts are actually physical, and they resemble more or less vampires. They don't suck blood. <clears throat> but the body comes out of the tomb and haunts. Oh. And then the way you stop it, again, you destroy the body. Another yeah. technique, if you go to Scotland, you'll see cairns where they pile boulders. And the tour guides will say these were prominent people were buried. No, that was to keep them in the ground. You pile all these boulders, uh, yeah. boulders there. Oh. Um, <clears throat> another technique is um, you bury the person upside down. Uh, for some reason, that keeps them from coming out of the coffin. In other words, upside down, uh, face down, or yes, upside face down, down. I should say. Okay, I'm face sorry. Down. Face down is a better way to say it. Yeah, got it. Uh, oddly enough, there's a famous I forget where it is in Virginia, from Colonial Virginia, and some man buried his wife face down, and on the tombstone, it says, "Here lies so and so, my widow, or my, I'm sorry, my wife deceased, and I buried her with her face pointing towards hell, ah, or her mouth. I'm sorry, pointing." Oh. Towards hell. <laughs> yeah, there you this go. This was a bitter husband, apparently. Oh, my word. Um, now, incidentally, years ago, and I wish I had kept the information, but I didn't. I was, uh, I was again, this was probably 1990, and I was young and teaching. And this girl in my class came up after class, and we've been on a usual topic. And she told me this story of her, uh, her, her close friend had died in a horrible car accident at age 16. This girl I was talking to was 19. When he, she was 16, her friend who was 16 died in a horrible accident. And then she proceeded to tell me, this girl, they often marry young down here, got married this this just a few months earlier. And they had a she had a big wedding in a church. And later at the reception, she had a photographer filming the wedding and also the reception, her dead friend is in the pictures. Mm -hmm. Oh, and man. he's totally solid. It doesn't look like a, like a shadowy entity or a ball of light. Really? And she showed me the girl's high school 16-year-old picture and the girl in the photographs. It was interesting. No one remembers this girl at the wedding, point one. Point two, she's never talking to anybody. She's just standing in the background. But she's very clearly depicted. Now, this could be a coincidence. It could just be some wedding crasher that resembled the dead friend was there. But I was stunned. It's the exact same girl in appearance. And she's in about seven photographs. One's in the church. Oh, my. Uh, in the reception. 
All, all and, with the same uh, outfit on, for instance? Yes, yes. Okay. But again, if you see a ghost, it'll look normal. In fact, there was this Icelandic woman who allegedly had paranormal powers, and she used to do things in the 1930s. By the way, the Russians have a tradition. The reason so many people <coughs> don't have paranormal powers today is because they were we killed them all off during the witchcraft trials. Interesting notion. Ah. And this Icelandic woman claimed that when she went to a big city like New York at night, a significant number of people she would see on the street were actually yeah. dead. Ah, They would look totally normal. Yeah, yeah. But she claimed she had this ability to see that they were actually dead. Uh, oh, my. Some people be, say the same thing about uh, aliens living on the planet as well. They just walk around like us. Well, that's why I brought up that Umo tradition in the first half hour because yeah. I've been intrigued by it. And they allegedly look just like as we do, although they're hypersensitive to light. And the story is that at, they lose the ability to speak at puberty. Ah, They communicate telepathically, but some of them have retained the ability to speak past puberty. And they're the ones that come to Earth and they mingle among us. Mm -hmm. Now, again, it may just be a story, but I've always been intrigued. And I want to make it clear to your audience. We have this notion of false news today and truth and false mm -hmm. is uh, virtually everything we believe is um, their beliefs rather than facts. Mm -hmm. They tell us that space is infinite in science. We can't prove that scientifically. Um, and this is, again, in every they tell us in economics, talk about endless growth. That's clearly impossible. Economies cannot grow forever. Yeah. So uh, beliefs, though, that's why I teach myths and legends. They're they're important. We orient ourselves in the universe, and oddly enough, ultimately, uh, they be very important in, in the other side. You may very well encounter what you expect. Um, and I'll, I'll bet you're quite a fan of Joseph Campbell. Oh well. yes, yes. Oh yes, yes. That would be. Uh, fascinating for you to, um, I'm sure that in, in your class you mention him uh, and those theories of, of uh, myths and and those kinds of things that he portrayed as well. Well, this is how America's degenerated. This great scholar was actually in the 1930s Olympics. Is that right? Uh, I think it was the Berlin, was that 36 Olympics? Yeah, right. Yeah, he was... Um, he didn't win, but he was in it. Now, can you imagine this today? A college professor who can, who can uh, perform the Olympics. You know the Hubble, Edwin Hubble from the Hubble Telescope, the uh -huh. astronomer? <clears throat> he right. couldn't decide if he wanted to be a scientist or a heavyweight boxer. Oh, my. He, he boxed. Yeah. Um, he was a really curious character. He was from Missouri, but he spoke with an English accent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I remember... <laughs> Back in the day, uh, in the 40s, uh, the 30s and stuff, that was quite a a fad to have an English accent, I, I think. And a lot well, of some of those old films, they, they exactly, the actresses, yeah, even the actors and actresses, yeah. even if they weren't, um, they kind of uh, did that for their own longevity or something. I don't know. I lived in Scotland for four years, but I can never pick up accents i can hear them ah and i've lived down in southern ohio for now most of my life now because i've taught here so long but i don't pick up the accent although i hear them and i've lived down here so long when i go back home which is the southern michigan yeah now i hear they have an accent i never heard it before yeah yeah but i hear it <clears throat> uh especially southeast michigan and uh it's actually quite heavy and i never noticed it growing up there <laughs> So, you know, and, and that, that is an interesting idea that literally people in a certain area uh, talk in a certain way. It's almost like, you know, um, that, uh, why is that, you know? <laughs> but and, and, it, a, and it's so dramatic in some cases. There's a great story, and I forget the man's name. He was a, uh, sadly, when they had used Australia as a penal colony in the 19th century, he was a runaway convict. He ran off into some of the wastelands of West Australia. And he was found, he was British. 
some Aboriginal people found him near death. And he was holding a human thigh bone. He had picked it up as a weapon. He found a dead corpse out in the desert. And he was holding this human thigh bone as a weapon near death. Well, they helped him, gave him water, food. He proceeded to live the next 35 years, I think it was, among the Aboriginal people. And when they eventually found him again, the British, he had gone completely Aboriginal. He could barely speak English. Yeah. He'd forgotten it. And he'd completely gone into the into the culture. Kind of intriguing. It's so, like uh dances with wolves or something. You know, yeah. I remember that that film. Well, that's oh, that. that's wasn't there a bestseller called Dancing with Lawyers? Remember that? <laughs> remember that book? I don't, I don't remember that. But. <laughs> it was a guide for, actually, it was a serious book, had a good title. It was How to Choose a Lawyer. Uh, and it was actually, a, it was not criticizing lawyers, but they had a clever title on it. Yeah, that, that is clever. I like it. <laughs> Dancing with Lawyers. And by the way, you know that Washington, D.C. has more lawyers than Japan? Oh, my, I'll bet. <laughs> oh, and and. And that's kind of unique to think how small Washington D.C. is as well, <laughs> you know. Oh my goodness! But of course, um, America has been run by lawyers. All the politicians, by and large, are lawyers. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> if you want oh, to go into politics, you go into law. Typically. Typically, yeah. yeah. It's it's fascinating. Um, I don't know what it is about lawyers uh, going into politics. They don't seem, it doesn't seem to just naturally follow um, because, uh, you know, most, most lawyers would, I, I, I know, would probably take a cut in pay, you know, to get into politics, yes. you know, that kind of a thing. So I, I don't know. The last history professor that was president was Woodrow Wilson and he got us in World War One. So don't, oh vote for his, don't vote for history professors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Um are, are you finding uh, the students, well, you know, tell me about this, by the way, since the COVID lockdown, um, uh, how has that affected your, uh, your ability to teach and, and the, uh, the, the university that you are a professor at at this point? Is it starting now to open back up? Shawnee State University handled this start to finish the worst possible way. They would, for uh, example... They would not be upfront of what they were doing. We should have announced, for example, uh, when we're going to open. Everything was vague. They're letting professors decide when to come back. So as a result, um, there are virtually no classes being taught in person. I have actually taught all year in person, and I'm one of the few professors. Wow. I'm one of the oldest professors here. I'm a cancer patient. And I've been on cancer treatment so long, I developed a heart condition from the drugs. Yeah. So I can come in and teach, but these young whippersnappers. <laughs> well, by the way, I've noticed the correspondence. Uh, I don't know what it is, but other professors have noticed too. The more liberal people are, the more terrified they are of the disease. Mm -hmm. There are My department has a lot of really left-wing people in it, and some of them have not set foot on campus since a year ago, March. Yeah, I'll bet. And our classes are degenerating. Some of the professors are not teaching correctly. They're just posting um, PowerPoint notes and giving reading assignments. That's what they call an online class. Mm -hmm. I myself have been forced to do um, summer classes, I, but I've uh, online because they won't show up anymore for summer classes. But what I've done is I've recorded lectures and put posted them in Internet Archive. In fact, if someone in your audience is interested in some of the strange subjects I've been talking about, type in my name, Internet Archive, and you can listen to some of these. So, uh, you know, that that would be fascinating for people to find out more information about you specifically. And they basically just go to your name and, and Internet Archives or would they go to the university name as well? Well, in fact, I have my own website, uh, markmirabello.com. Okay. And it'll give you links to the Internet Archive lectures. It'll give you links to my books. Uh, give you links to, I've done, frankly, this is probably the um, 30th podcast I've done. Yeah. I've done uh, a little bit of television, film documentary, been in a couple documentaries. 
Of course. Uh, podcast, radio. Ancient aliens. Yes. So, but again, when you're interested in strange stuff, you can get the gigs. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, it's, uh, I'm finding, because I've been in, in touch with a, a lot of um, people over the years that have been researchers and, and uh, investigators into the paranormal who are now finally getting uh, contacted by the old, the ancient aliens television series, you know, and the various production companies that are finally now getting back into the swing of things uh, from the COVID lockdown. So I'm, in, I'm encouraged about, you know, supposedly things getting a little bit more opened up as far as uh, productions go and, and uh, conferences are starting to happen again. I just came back from uh, Texas in a UFO conference that was one of the first ones to open up, you know, to uh, actual, um, you know, presentations by individuals. So oh, I'm, good, ho good. I'm hoping it's getting it better, uh, especially as the summer rolls along and the weather gets hotter. And um, because I, I mean, to tell you the truth, I've I, I don't put a lot of stock into this pandemic anyway. So, you know. Uh, By the way, on an average year, the United States, we have 2.7 million deaths of all causes. Yeah. Now, it sounds horrifying when they say 600,000 in a year and a half. But if you put it into perspective, it's, um, and I, again, as a historian, the Black Death killed one fourth to one half the population within oh, five my. years. Yeah. Killed them. Killed them. Not just kidding. Like <clears throat> killed them. We, some estimates are when the Europeans brought in their diseases to the Native Americans, we could be talking 90% for fatality <clears throat> rates. Oh, my. Um, they not only didn't had never experienced smallpox, there's some evidence the Native Americans had never even experienced cold, flu, chickenpox, measles, and these diseases just wiped them out because of their – in fact, one of the oddities is the um, – when you have a lot of diseases, it shrinks into your immune system. This is why, for a long time, Africa was was protected from European imperialism, because they called it the white man's grave. They, they would get sick and die. And now it wasn't wasn't until medical advances made it safer to go in for Europeans. So, I just want to make sure that I heard you just just a second ago. You said. More diseases cause a stronger immune system. Is that right? Well, oddly enough, although it kills people, this is the sad part. See, one of the things I made clear in my history class, especially when I'm talking ancient history, there's a tendency in America and Western Europe in general to, well, I always say it's all history. They teach it as Dracula versus Snow White. That <laughs> certain, certain, certain things are good and certain things are bad. This kind of Manichaean worldview. But in reality... Everything has a good side and a bad side. Uh -huh. And for example, the invention of agriculture made towns possible, civilization possible, but it also created um, the possibility of epidemics. There's a theory that epidemics all come from domestication of animals. Um, they don't talk about that anymore, but that's an older theory I think is true because there are too uh -huh. many animal lovers now. Uh -huh. uh, the civilization made slavery possible, prostitution possible, the tyrant possible, social classes possible, hierarchy possible, but it had benefits, but it had negative things as well. Yeah, The invention of writing sounds wonderful, but it actually has retarded human memory. Yeah. Preliterate peoples can memorize the entire Quran could be memorized by illiterate people and keep it in their head. Modern Americans have trouble remembering grocery lists. Um, Good point. We, we use writing as a crutch. And frankly... And and our computer, iPhone, our iPhones as well. Yeah, well, this is going to exacerbate the problem because um, we are dependent upon uh, this computers in general. Um, and it's going to weaken our memories and cause degeneration. So when it comes to disease, the, neg the negative part is obvious. It causes horrible suffering and death. But the positive side is, well, it strengthens us. In fact, oddly enough, when the Black Death hit and wiped out 
just huge numbers of people. For the survivors, it was a better world. They It caused wages to grow up because it was a labor shortage. It caused poor people to get richer because they inherited wealth from dead people. So if you managed to make it through, but it was a horrible disease, it was a better world for those that survived. Well, and I suppose you could argue that the people that made it through were genetically, I don't know about superior, but uh, um, genetically able to survive more. I don't know. By the way, one of the horror stories of, uh, I should mention this, uh, of course, in the, the, the horrible science of World War I was chemistry. It invented the chemical weapons. And World War II was physics, invented the, the atomic bomb. And now it's been predicted that the the horror science of the future will be biology. They they know, for example, it's possible to create what are called ethnic weapons. Right. Certain ethnic groups are more susceptible to certain illnesses. And yeah. um, for example, well, this just pops in, of course, it's widely known that, and certain diseases actually create, well, there's a theory, um, what is it, the... Um, the, there's a lung disease that is found almost exclusively among uh, Northern Europeans. Is it? Is I'm saying is a cystic fibrosis um, ah. lung that fills up with mucus. Yeah. And the theory is the reason that's found it does you don't find it among Africans, and the reason it's found among nor Northern Europeans because those who had it, the traits, the genetic traits. Are more resistant to the Black Death. Oh, so their ancestors survived the Black Death, but then lived to reproduce this problem. Yeah, yeah. So, um, um, and incidentally, um, it became they never cover this in our normal media, but our our buff special forces were became to Afghans almost a laughing stock because our tough looking special forces cannot drink the water that 10-year-old girls can drink in Afghanistan. <laughs> we I'll get be... sick. And we have yeah. to bring in bottled water. But these little girls can take it, and they think it's funny that we can't drink it. Civilization, strange enough, weakens us in a strange way. Now, I like living in a civilized world, but it does make us weaker. And there was a theory that that's where polio was spreading back in the day because it was scarcely found in third world countries, but people living in sanitary, clean environments, their children tended to get it. And because the immune systems were weaker. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh -huh. speaking of which, there's some evidence that the polio vaccine was introduced. They always to hail that as a great discovery yeah. in the 50s. Uh, was a direct cause. It's theoretical. You know that mesothelioma they're always advertising? Yes. Late at night? Yes. There's some evidence that people who took the polio vaccine, when exposed to asbestos, developed that disease. Uh huh. Which is why I have not taken the vaccine. Uh, um, you mean you mean the current vaccine or current the polio vaccine? Pol yeah. Well, I I've, I haven't either. There's no way I'm gonna go there. Well, I mean, it's uh, historically about twenty percent of vaccines are pulled after five years on the market. I mean, drugs, I should say. Yeah, of unexpected side effects. So I'll bet I'm not encouraging your audience to follow you know me in this, but um, personally, I didn't. Uh, I haven't taken it. So yeah. Uh, and uh, speaking of which, uh, I've been. Uh, this is empowering for students. Past year, I've been reported twice for being seen on campus without a mask on. <laughs> we have an anonymous think line. You can oh, turn bet. people in, and students. Um, it gives them a sense of power. I think. Yeah, <laughs> I'll bet. Well, um, you know, it, there are various states, uh, including Texas, which I was this at, um, that are actually getting to the point now where they're not even uh, mandating masks anymore in public. So um, the state of Washington is is supposedly going there as well, as far as uh, uh, if you're going into a restaurant or, a, you know, a place of business, you're supposed to wear one. But if you're outdoors... Uh, supposedly it's not a, a big deal anymore. And and I'll tell you what, in reality, there is no physics or science behind the idea that you could 
stop a uh, virus with a, a mask anyway. So we'll see. We'll see if I get banned on for saying that. But <laughs> Yes. Um, well, I completely lost track of the time. I don't have a clock, so I hope we're not. Oh, we're, we got uh, about uh, 10, 15 minutes to go here. We are just coming down to the wire, and this has just been fascinating to me. Uh, listening to uh, the background that you're that you're relating to us is uh, I, I took I, I one of my most favorite courses I took as an undergraduate in college was comparative religions, and um, I I I took it from a, a Buddhist uh, prof a professor who was uh, a, a Buddhist himself, and I thought that was a fascinating subject. The idea that uh, people look at God, you know, a little bit differently than what I was taught when growing up in a small little town, you know, in Washington State as a kid. Um, and now I'm learning a, boy, a lot more about the idea of cultures and how they deal with uh, death and dying and uh, the afterlife and ghosts. Uh, I, I'm really enjoying this. By the way, let me give you some words for your audience Yeah, that will guarantee paradise. Okay. <laughs> Namu Amida Butsu. Ah. And that's what almost this like is. Klatu Barato Nikte. Huh? <laughs> what this is, and um, there's a form, you mentioned Buddhism. That's what reminded me of this. Um, Buddhism, of course, originally starts in northern India. And what's curious as it spreads, it seems to change. Westerners are alarmed by this. Like it is different in China and Tibet than it is in, for example, in Sri Lanka and in Thailand. And of course, because of our prejudices, Western scholars try to say, well, the original form is the purest form. These layers are corrupted. Well, that's not what really is going on there. And there's a branch of Buddhism. In fact, the, 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 the words I just gave you are from Japanese. You can say it in any language. And uh, but that was in Japanese, corrupted Japanese, as I'm speaking it. And there's this notion in Buddhism, and this will sound familiar. Of there was the Amida Buddha, he's called, and he lived long, long ago, in a universe far, far away. Doesn't that sound like start of Star Wars? Yeah. See, George Lucas took anthropology classes. He probably got this idea. Yeah. And, and long ago, <clears throat> in another universe. There was this man, not the historic Buddha we talk about in India. He's a completely separate person who also achieved enlightenment and achieved nirvana, which is release from the endless cycle rebirth. But a form of Buddhism, Buddhism called Pure Land Buddhism, it's found in Japan and China, among other places. It teaches when a, when a person achieves enlightenment, but decides out of an act of supreme generosity that he's not going to go to nirvana or accept nirvana until everybody is liberated. The supreme act of generosity creates a what's called a pure land. It's a heaven. Now, I may say, wait a minute. How can just doing something create a heaven? Remember, in Buddhist thought, everything is thought. So just as this universe is made of thought only, so is a pure land. And according to pure land Buddhism, this type of Buddhism is for the late corrupt age. The Hindus call the Kali Yuga. That we're so corrupt nowadays, we need special assistance. And if you say this once in your lifetime, Namu Amida Butsu, when you die, you go to paradise. Now, I should also mention, this is similar to ideas found in Hinduism and in evangelical Christianity. Evangelical Christianity teaches, even if you're a sinner, if you accept Jesus as your personal savior, you go to paradise. In Hinduism, it's called bhakti yoga. If you accept, for example, mm -hmm. uh, Krishna as a kind of uh, savior figure, devotion to him, Hail Krishna, remember the George Harrison song? Yeah. My sweet Lord is to Krishna. Who, oddly enough, after his death, the Beatles had all played at Hinduism in the 60s. Harrison actually took it seriously. And after his death, he had instructions to, his ashes were put in the Ganges River. 
which is also a way to achieve release yeah in hinduism so we oh, took it seriously fascinating yeah but um this notion of salvation through um a savior figure is also found in many many religions that even if you're weak corrupt uh you can be saved so it's a beautiful concept um just to clarify for me uh namu Amida Butsu. Does that translate anything in English that yes, could be a, yes. a, a phrase? Uh, yes, I'm trying to remember what it is in English. It's roughly to, I think it's basically hail to the Buddha of infinite light, roughly. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm going to write that down to make sure I realize. <laughs> hail to the Buddha of infinite light. Yes. Okay. Uh, do a search on Amida Buddha. The Amida Buddha, A-M-I-D-A. Well, oh, here's what's interesting about Pure Land Buddhism. He's just one such Buddha. There's an infinite number of Pure Lands, an infinite number of these Buddhas. Ah. Because um, the notion that, you know, this universe is multifaceted with many, many beings, uh, he's just the most famous one. And this idea that we all don't go to paradise, I mean, we all nobody goes to paradise till we all go, is this idea, again, like Eloa, the angel, we want to save everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which reminds me of another anecdote. I was lecturing in class again years ago, and there was this lady who used to always come about five minutes late. She was a non-traditional student in her 40s, always well-dressed, high heels, blouse, skirt. So I'm assuming she was coming from work. It was a five o'clock class. So she would come in late, never said a word, sat in the very back. And we were off on some discussion point and I made a comment just personally, my own opinion. Somebody asked me about it and I said, I really can't think of any crime against me that I'd want someone to suffer forever. Maybe a long time, but not forever. And yeah. I made that comment. And this lady raises her hand, very elegant lady. This is part of the story. Huh. In a very calm voice, she said, I disagree. There are some crimes and sins that are so horrible, people deserve to burn forever. And the whole class was quiet. You could hear a pin drop. Everybody was focused on this lady. And I've never seen a person lose an audience faster because her very next words were, she started to tell us why her ex-husband deserved to go to hell forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll bet. So she lost the crowd after that. Oh, uh, being a family law lawyer and a, <laughs> a settlement judge in the family and juvenile court, I I can well imagine some of those stories. Holy mackerel. I think it was, I'm trying to think, um, Miller, the novelist that married Marilyn Monroe. Was it Henry Miller that tried ah. to he famously said, this is, again, for your ladies. This guy was a chauvinist, so we're not trying to endorse this. But he said, you don't know, you really don't know a woman until you meet her in court. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> oh, my. Um, a three-day trial with my ex-wife. Uh, <laughs> and, of course, I couldn't afford a lawyer, so I'm representing myself. You know, it was a nightmare. <laughs> oh, my. Did she clean you up? Uh, no, thank God. <laughs> The, the female judge took mercy on me. Actually, I, <laughs> I was I was very surprised. <clears throat> anyway, um, gosh, uh, Mark, this has just been a real pleasure for for me. Uh, I'm going to encourage people to go to your your website, markmarabello.com, right? Yes. Uh, to to find out more about you, and um, I'm I'm so uh, impressed and thankful that you were able to spend. Uh, this wee hours of the morning on uh, Sunday here for, with us on Spaced Out Radio. We're going to have to do this again uh, the next time you come out with uh, your new book or a new project that you've got. I think that would be a lot of fun. Well, thank you. I really enjoy this. You're a really good host. Excellent questions. You're just really a good, good, good host, good person. Oh, it's thank you. A real pleasure. It's three o'clock in the morning where I am. Yes, it is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna let you get out of here. Uh, no, no sense sticking around after the show. I'm just gonna do the bumper music and uh, do my sign off after that. So, go well, ahead. As the and, college students say, "I'm going home to crash." All right. 
Good for you. you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Talk to you later. Good night. Man, he had a deep dark hole upon. People came from miles around to throw their trash down in to see how deep the hole was and listen for its end. Then one day, that fateful day, they forced Mel off his land. Paid him off and sent him off down under with a plan. They hit Mel's hole and covered it up so nary could be found. So no one would ever know what's deep down in Mel's ground. Yippee I To find yourself in eastern Washington And hear the legend of Mel's Hole Be wary, my be found So no one would ever know Well, I want to thank, uh, remind everyone That uh, Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal Is the official music of Spaced Out Radio Rocking us in and out of every single show We can find out more information Bumblefoot.com under with a plan. They hit Mel's hole and covered it up so nary could be found. A special thanks to everyone listening in at home and in your cars and at work and in the chat rooms tonight. We uh, want to thank everyone around the world. Remember, this show is currently copyrighted by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures. Thank you for sharing your evening with us tonight because together, my friends, we own the night. Good night, everyone. We'll talk to you next Sunday on Spaced Out Radio. Radio.